During the summer of 1983, in a quiet town near Minneapolis, Minnesota, the charred body of a woman was found inside the kitchen stove of a small farmhouse. A video camera was also found in the kitchen, standing on a tripod and pointing at the oven. No tape was found inside the camera at the time. Although the scene was originally labelled as a homicide by police, an unmarked VHS tape was later discovered at the bottom of the farm's well, which had apparently dried up earlier that year. Despite its warm condition, and the fact that it contained no audio, police were still able to view the contents of the tape. It depicted a woman recording herself in front of a video camera, seemingly using the same camera the police found in the kitchen. After positioning the camera to include both her and her kitchen stove in the image, the tape then showed her turning on the oven, opening the door, crawling inside, and closing the door behind her. Eight minutes into the video, the oven could be seen shaking violently, after which point, thick black smoke could be seen emanating from it. The camera then continued to stationary point at the oven for another 45 minutes, until the batteries apparently died. To avoid disturbing the local community, police never released any information about the tape, or even the fact that it was found. Police were also not able to determine who put the tape into the well, or why the physical stature of the woman on the tape did not in any way resemble the stature of the woman found in the oven. On the 24th of May 1970, the Soviet Union started a project that will be known as the Kola Superdeep Borehole. Although it has long been since abandoned, the hole still exists today, and measures about 40,000 feet in depth. Be it for research, or whatever claims have been told, the Kola Borehole is not the only time Russia dug further than they should have, and several holes can still be found today, unprotected in the desolate Russian wilderness. The biggest mistake of my life is going down one of these holes. A year ago, my work took me to a small Russian fishing village located in Siberia. It's a tiny place populated by no more than 200 people, most of them fishermen or hunters. It wasn't the first time being a scientist had gotten me into strange situations. I'm a geologist, which is not important for the purpose of this story, but I have experience in search and rescue operations back in the United States. My Russian language abilities were less than satisfactory, and considering only two people besides my crew spoke English in the village, it was a challenge to say the least. However, with the right spirit and willingness to share a bottle of vodka, they were some of the friendliest people that I'd ever met in my entire life. I particularly enjoyed the company of the village's only police officer, Vadim, who happened to speak at least basic level English. His job mostly consisted of escorting people home after they had had a bit too much to drink. Although he oftentimes partook in the drinking, rather than stopping it. Needless to say, we quickly became good friends. We rather enjoyed ourselves in such a bizarre world cut off from civilization. At least we did, until the ninth month of our deployment. One of the local's seven-year-old daughter had gone missing. Her name was Daria, and she had been out playing with her friends around an old abandoned building widely believed to be a Soviet-era silo. The whole structure had been closed off for almost 40 years, and forgotten, yet the children loved hanging out in the area. 
On that particular day, the silo was open. The doors were broken down, which revealed a large room full of ancient equipment, and a large, dark hole in the centre. The hole measured about 50 feet in diameter, and the depth was unknown. There was a basic elevator platform in the centre of the hole, like something used for descending mines. All that could be seen was endless darkness reaching into the abyss. Daria had fallen into it. I immediately knew in my heart that the fall had killed her. A fall that deep, even if at the bottom was a pool of water, it would have been lethal. The other children insisted that Daria had called out for help after falling into the hole, which gave out false hope to the terrified mother. It was for the first time I had seen Vadim efficiently work to put together a rescue operation. Calling for official aid so far out was a hopeless task. Even if they sent help, they would arrive too late. Seeing as I had some experience in that field, alongside basic first aid training, I volunteered, as did one of my colleagues, Stanley. While the mechanics attempted to revive the old machinery, including the elevator, I attached a sinker to a line in hopes of measuring the depth. The line wasn't long enough to determine where the bottom was, even though the longest rope combined measured almost a thousand feet. After a few hours, the mechanics announced that the elevator was ready, but they had found some sort of protective suits. According to the few documents they found in the facility, the atmospheric pressure was quite high, and the temperatures reached up to 150 Fahrenheit. I knew then, we would retrieve nothing but the body of a little girl for the family to bury. Got off. Ready? Vladimir asked us. The suits were poorly fitted to our slightly untrained figures and chafed in places I didn't know possible. We entered the lift, which was protected by a rusty metal cage full of holes. We were given only one walkie-talkie to communicate to the people on the surface, in addition to some old flashlights. We ready. Lower us down, Stanley said. The gears running the elevator platform started churning. A clunky sound echoed through the room down the hall. There was a small screen on the elevator, with numbers signifying the depth. It was an excruciatingly slow process, no more than a foot a second. However, the change in atmosphere was imminent. We descended. A hundred feet. Darkness had already enveloped us. The weak flashlights we had brought along hardly provided any comfort. You think this is dark? Wait till you see winter in village, Vadim said his usual dull humour. Me and Stanley both faked a chuckle. Would you please check if the radio works for Dean? I asked. It works. No worries. He responded. Five hundred feet. The walkie sounded for the first time since our descent almost ten minutes ago. The Russian was heavy, and the static made it incomprehensible to a novice such as myself. What was that, Vadim? I asked. Oh, they just ask how deep we are. Shouldn't we be able to hear them talking? We're only 500 feet down? Stanley asked. Yes, something strange here, Vadim said. Other than the electrical hum of the ancient elevator, and the sound of Stanley nervously shifting his weight, we couldn't hear the chatter of people just above us. Very strange, Vadim mumbled to himself. Something about Vadim seemed off. I had never seen him worried like that before. Guys, is it getting really warm here or is it just me? Yeah, I'm sweating bullets already, I responded. A thousand feet. 
Oh, Margite. A small voice cried out from the depths below. Did you hear that? I asked. Hear what? Someone called out for help below. I hear nothing. I put a finger to my lips, gesturing for silence, while listening attentively. Then I heard the same voice again. Help! The same voice, but slightly louder. There it was again! Yes, I heard it, Vadim said. Hold on. They called for help. Yes, you heard it too. Of course, but it was in English. It wasn't too unusual for the children to pick up a bit of English, maybe a word or two while we were visiting. But this wasn't that. It didn't make sense for a young girl to know that word. Not in a tiny Siberian village. Vadim called out for the voice but got no response. Damn it, can't we make this thing go any faster? 4,000 feet. More than an hour had passed and we couldn't see the bottom yet. It had been quite some time since we heard the voice, and I had developed a throbbing headache from the heat. If someone had really called out from the bottom, we should have reached it already. Guys, I see light, Vadim announced. What are you talking about? Light at the bottom. Look. He frantically jumped up and down while pointing towards the darkness below. There's nothing there, Vadim, Stanley said. How can you not see? It's so bright. I glanced over at Stanley in confusion. My first thought was that Vadim was going crazy due to the heat and darkness. Five thousand feet. None of us had said a single word since Vadim told us about the light. Our moods were descending much faster than the elevator, and on top of that, my headache was almost killing me. Out of nowhere, the elevator stopped, shaking violently in the process. It knocked me straight to the floor, and I was out in an instant. A few seconds passed while I came back up, and I saw Stanley lying, unmoving next to me. Vadim, however, was nowhere to be found. Stan, are you alright? I shook his shoulder. He grunted as he sat back up. What the hell just happened? I don't know, man, but Vadim's gone. What? Where did he go? I don't know, he just vanished. We looked around. There was no way out of the elevator. Although there were a few holes in the metal cage surrounding us, it would still be impossible for a large man such as Vadim to get through. Hey, I found the walkie, Stanley said. Try calling the surface. He called for help, but static was the only response. We tried to call out for Vadim, but he was far gone. The elevator started descending again. Screw this, let's go back up, Stanley pleaded. I clicked a few buttons on the panel. How? The controls are broken. Only the ones on the surface work. He started screaming for the people up top to bring us back. But we both knew there was no way they could hear us from way down here. 10,000 feet. It had taken more than four hours to get that deep. The heat was getting worse for each feet descended. I had already passed out a few times from dehydration, despite having brought an ample amount of water. Why haven't they brought us back up yet? Stanley asked with a weak voice. He was quite a bit older than myself, so he was rapidly dehydrating from the heat. I didn't know it was even possible to be down this far. Stanley didn't respond. He'd fallen unconscious, but I lacked the energy to wake him. I was about to pass out for the ninth time myself. I was only jolted back into consciousness by what sounded like singing. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever heard. It was in Russian, and I didn't understand what it was about, but it was so serene, so pure. Stan? I called out with a fading voice. Can you hear that? Who's singing? He mumbled half asleep. A light appeared in the depths, 
and the singing got louder. I see it, the light, I said. The elevator stopped once more. Stan was gone. Just like Vadim, he had vanished into thin air. But the light remained. The beautiful, warm light. It started moving towards me. And the closer I got, the more I felt at peace. The light ascended until I saw nothing but the brightness surrounding me. Then, there was nothing. I woke up in a hospital one week later. I had been found in the middle of a forest in eastern Russia by a pair of hunters. I had no documentation or proof of who I was, and as they claimed, my story didn't add up. No such hole existed according to public records, which wasn't much of a surprise, but when I dug deeper, I realized the village I had stayed in for the better part of a year wasn't even on the map. The ordeal had taken a toll on my mind, leaving several gaps in my memory, though I could recall a few phone numbers from my colleagues. When I called them, their numbers were all either disconnected or reached completely unrelated people. After a lengthy investigation, I was allowed to travel back to the United States on an emergency travel document. My fingerprints matched some documentation of my existence, which helped. Not criminal records, mind you. When I returned home, I discovered that my house was owned by someone else, and had been for at least 10 years. It took me a long time to figure out what had happened, but some changes were too big to be a horrible coincidence. Putting aside the personal changes I've experienced here, even world history doesn't match what I remember studying. Geography is vastly different. Heck, there's an entire continent missing from the map. Denial is a powerful tool. It took me months to come to term with a very simple fact. This is not the world I belong to. One summer day in Southampton, New York, a woman pulled into a gas station. As the attendant pumped gas, the woman told him she was in a hurry to pick up her daughter who had just finished an art class in East Hampton. A well-dressed man walked over and started talking to her. He explained that his rental car had died, and he needed a ride to East Hampton for an appointment. She said she was happy to give him a ride. He put his briefcase in the back seat, and said that he was going quickly to visit the men's room. The woman looked at her watch, and suddenly panicked. She drove off quickly, having forgotten the man was coming back to the car for a ride. She thought nothing of him again, until she and her daughter pulled into their driveway. The man saw his briefcase, and realized she had forgotten him. She opened the briefcase looking for some form of identification, so that she could notify him about his belongings. Inside, she found nothing but a knife and a roll of duct tape. I'm not sure where or how to begin, so I'll just give a bit of context about myself before telling my story. My name's Todd Summers, and I'm a 29-year-old male living in a small apartment complex in the state of Oregon. My life, or what I can only describe to be a miserable existence, isn't pleasant or peaceful. It hasn't been since the day of my 18th birthday, in the year of 2008. The year that I lost everything and on what was supposed to be the most special day of my life. Why my life's miserable, you might be asking. Well, it's a very long and pitiful story. It's not a story I've shared with many people, due to how traumatized I get just even remembering the events of that one year. But I feel as though I need to tell someone about it, 
before I completely lose what sanity I have left and go completely bananas. When I was a kid, roughly between age 4 to 15, I lived in New Mexico with my mum, my five-year-old sister Shannon, and my dirtbag father, in a one-story house in a quiet neighbourhood. My mum worked as a cashier at a CVS at the time, and my dad worked as a professional landscaper. My mum was very kind towards me and Shannon while we were growing up, but my dad was a totally different story. I'll explain a bit about him first. My dad always seemed like a casual guy in public, but in reality, he was possibly the worst type of scumbag that you could ever come across. He was an alcoholic, and a complete abusive sack of horseshit when not on the job or in public. In addition to that, he also had the temper of an enraged gorilla. Ever since I can remember, he'd abuse us in the most horrible ways you can imagine. He'd beat us with a razor-wired riding crop whenever we got on his nerves or did something he didn't like, locked us up in the basement, deprived us of food, and did some other things that were so horrid that I don't even want to mention it. I have many scars because of this. My mum was also a victim to his abuse and would constantly be berated, slapped, assaulted, and beaten by dad if she tried to stand up to him or defend us. Because of the constant abuse my dad put her through, she easily gave in to his will and did not try standing up for herself. And I couldn't blame her for that. My sister Shannon was like my mother, a kind-hearted girl who would always try to stand up for me when I was in trouble. But she was also timid like my mum was, since she also suffered heavy abuse from our father and was too afraid to try and stand up to him. Now that I've mentioned a bit about my family, I should mention everything that happened a year prior to my 18th birthday, before I continue the story, so you get a better understanding of things. My dad never allowed mum to let me or Shannon have birthdays in his house, as he put it, because he always said that we were mistakes that God put on the planet, and that mistakes don't need it or deserve birthdays. Because of this, none of us were able to have a real birthday. Since he was usually home on all my previous birthdays, I would make sure that mum didn't try throwing any parties behind his back. If she argued about it with him, or so much as even mentioned our birthdays around him, dad would beat her with his razor-wired riding crop until she bled in some areas. She had a lot of scars on her body because of his previous beatings, and so did Shannon and I. About two years prior to my 18th birthday, my dad had gotten fired from his construction job for reasons I didn't know. Now this may sound very hard to believe when I tell you this, but I assure you that it's true. My mum never found out that my dad was fired because of two things. One, he never told her, and two, he lied to my mum and said that he'd been promoted and would be starting at his new job location as the assistant manager, but it would be a few months or so before he started. How do I know he was fired? Because the year he was fired, I heard him from my living room having a shouting match over the phone with supposedly his boss about how he never liked the job anyway, and that his boss's whole company was just a giant pile of dog shit that deserved to be burned from the ground. I remember feeling my blood turn to ice when I overheard him threatening his boss by saying that if he even so much as thought about telling the police about what he found, he'd have his new friend, 
some guy by the name of Mr. Victor Vasquez silence him and his family. I don't know who this Vasquez guy was, and honestly, I wasn't sure that I wanted to find out. By some stroke of bad luck, my dad had noticed me overhearing his argument, and warned me that if I spoke a word of this to my mum, he'd chain me and Shannon up in the basement, and beat us with a crowbar until our skulls bled out. Terrified, I never said a word to my mum about it, although I probably should have. My mum's job luckily provided her enough money to keep the house running, but the next several weeks were after that phone call. Things didn't get any better. I honestly don't know why she didn't divorce my dad, after all the shit he put her through all those years. I even questioned mum as to why we couldn't do just that many times before, but she said that it was because his job made more money than hers did, and she wouldn't be able to keep affording the house if she filed for divorce. Once dad started going to work at this new site, a four months later, my mum began to grow suspicious when she noticed a few things. The first thing she noticed was that my dad started hanging out with these mean looking Mexican guys, who he said were part of his new construction crew over to our house to chat and get drunk on our front yard. But my mum had doubts about that being true. These men were about as cruel and heartless as my dad, if not worse. My mum got very bad vibes from these men, due to the way they acted. They would make very rude and offensive comments about my mum, Shannon, and I. Some of the comments were even racist. If my mum told them to stop or tried to get them to leave, they'd get hostile and threaten to tie her up and beat her if she didn't show them respect. My dad actually shared that opinion and told my mum that unless she wanted to be sodomized by his friends, she better show some respect towards them. He'd say things like, you better do as my boys say and show them some respect unless you wanna get hurt. They're my friends and no one shows any disrespect towards them. Also, that one thing she noticed was how much money he had started making. Each Friday, dad would receive paychecks of up to about 50 to $60,000, which was far higher than the amount of money he used to get paid on his previous work location. My dad's job paid him about $25 an hour, so there's no way that he would be making that much money in just two weeks. When my mum questioned him about why his pay rate was so incredibly high, all of a sudden Friday night, when me and Shannon were eating dinner in the living room, he lied and said it was because he was working for a very wealthy contractor who paid him extra for overtime. She didn't believe him and demanded to know where he was working and what this new job involved. And my dad got aggressive and told her that it was none of her business. My mum said, none of my business, it's my business too. I live here and this house is also mine, so I have every damn right to know. In response to this, my dad slapped her and shouted, who the hell do you think you are talking back to me like that? It's my money, not yours. His yelling caught my attention and I ran over to the entrance to the dining room where I saw dad yelling in her face. This is my house, my house. I own you, I own these two little maggots that I told you to abort years ago. I made it clear that I wanted them gone, but no, you had to have kids, didn't you? We'd have more money if we'd have just gotten rid of those goddamn mistakes. My mum then did something I'd never seen her do. She shoved him back 
and then yelled, You know what? I've had it with your threats and your shit. I want a divorce and I want it now. If you hate us so damn bad, well just leave. You've been nothing but a goddamn piece of shit ever since the kids were born and I've had enough. And if you ever hurt the kids again, I'll tell the police everything you've ever done to us all these years. What my dad did next still gives me nightmares to this day. He grabbed my mum by the neck, pinned her against the wall, and pulled out a gun from his pocket and pressed it to my mum's head. You listen to me, and you listen right now. You're not going anywhere, unless I say so, and neither are those two little twats. And if you ever, and I mean ever, backtalk me again, or try going to the cops, I swear to God and Satan, I'll take a goddamn chainsaw to your limbs. Then, I'll bring my boys over here and have them destroy you and those two little maggots. You got that? My mum was visibly terrified, and so were me and Shannon. Up until now, the worst my dad had ever done was beat us. But now he had totally taken the abuse to a whole new level. When my mum only whimpered in fear, my dad fired a shot between her feet, and then shouted, I asked you a goddamn question, and I want a goddamn answer right now. Answer me, or I'll kill you and those brats. My mum whimpered in both pain and fear, then nodded. But my dad fired another shot and yelled, I want a verbal answer, not a nod. When I ask you a question, you answer yes or no. Now answer me properly. My mum started. Ye yes. Then I saw my dad snarl, and then he threw my mum down to the floor and spat in her face. He then said, You better learn your place. This is my house. You have no control unless I say so. Consider yourself and those maggots nothing more than slaves. A bunch of pigs meant to serve me. I'm going out now, and I'd better see my dinner ready by the time I get back, slave. If not, I'll have my boys come down here and absolutely wreck you. He then stormed out of the house and went to God knows where. Probably off to a bar to get drunk. After Dad was gone, we rushed over to confront our mum who was in tears and we began crying as well. We had all pretty much been through quite enough with that bastard. And that's when my mum did something she should have done a long time ago. She called the police and told them that we needed them down to our house right now. Once they arrived, all three of us gave the officers our report on what happened. We also told them about how abusive he had been towards us for the past 10 years and even showed them all the scars on our backs from where he had whipped us with his riding crop. When the two officers saw this, they asked mum where my dad was now, and she said that she had no idea. Me and Shannon told them that he simply stormed out of the house and left in his truck. We gave them a description of the truck, which was a black 2001 Toyota Tundra, and also gave them the license plate. After about an hour, the police called us and informed my mum that dad was now in police custody, and he now had additional criminal charges. Apparently, the cops found my dad hanging out behind a strip club with those dirty Mexican friends of his, drinking beer and smoking crystal meth. When they approached him and attempted to put him under arrest for attempted assault with a deadly weapon, he of course resisted and did the most foolish thing anyone could do. Dad threw out his gun and opened fire on the officers, hitting one officer in the leg and the other one in his arm. Then he took off in his truck and fled the scene. His friends took off running into the strip club where they were later caught and arrested for illegal drug possession. My dad was eventually stopped by the police when they cut him off at a railway crossing where a long freight train was stopped on the tracks 
blocking off the two-line road with their patrol cars. When he attempted to open fire on the cops, an officer tased him with the taser gun and took him into custody. When they searched his truck for any other potential weapons, they found a small unlocked safe underneath the back seats which contained tons of illegal drugs, ranging from marijuana to crystal meth and LSD. But what they found with the drugs was something that answered the question that mum had questioned my dad about. It was a list of drugs and how many had been sold. As it turns out, my dad had been working for a Mexican drug cartel for about four months. Remember those men dad was hanging out with? And remember that name, Victor Vasquez? Turns out, Mr. Vasquez was the boss of an extremely dangerous and savage Mexican drug cartel. And those Mexican guys my dad hung out with and invited over to our house were members of the cartel. When the police told us all of this, I remembered that threatening warning my dad had given to his old construction job boss over the phone about killing him if he reported him to the cops. I understood now what must have happened, but the police apparently had already found out and told us everything. Sure enough, my guess was right. The police informed my mum over the phone that when they had contacted his old boss and asked him questions about my dad, they were told that he had fired my dad for hiding drugs in his locker, but he was too afraid to go to the police because he said that dad was friends with a dangerous Mexican drug cartel boss and was afraid that if he went to the cops, the cartel would come after him and his family and kill them. We were all horrified and disgusted when the police told us all of this but we were so relieved to hear that he was in custody along with his filthy drug cartel buddies. Me, mum, and Shannon all appeared in court a few days later and gave our testimonies to the judge. And my dad was found guilty of abuse, physical assault, assault with a deadly weapon, attempted murder of a police officer, and drug trafficking, and sentenced to 30 to 50 years in prison without bail or parole. I'll never forget what my dad said as the cops dragged him away to begin serving his sentence in prison. He yelled, you better pray. You better pray to God that I never get out because when I do, you're all dead. All of you are dead. His voice was silenced once the doors of the courtroom slammed shut behind him. I knew that dad would never get his hands on us since he'd pretty much be locked up for the rest of his life. He was in his late 50s, and his sentence was 30 to 50 years, meaning he'd either be in his 90s or early 100s when released. Most likely, he'd be dead before that, so it didn't matter. I never heard about what happened to those other cartel friends of his, but I assumed they ended up getting locked up as well. Art of that event, our lives got so much better over the next several months. My mom got promoted to being the manager of the CVS pharmacy around October and also got an increase in salary. And she started dating a 49 year old retired Navy veteran named George around November. He was the nicest man my mom had ever met and treated her like a queen. He also loved me and Shannon. The two of them eventually married in December, and George became my stepdad. Me and Shannon even started making a few friends in school. Because of our real father, we'd not been able to socialize very well due to all the heavy abuse we had to endure from him. But that wasn't a problem anymore. With dad gone from the house, we were free to do what we wanted without him controlling our lives. I began to pursue a dream that I'd had since I was a kid, and that was becoming a comic book artist. I enrolled in various classes in school, and Shannon planned to one day become a professional photographer, as she loved photography. Life seemed perfect now. But unfortunately, I'm sorry to say the story doesn't end here. 
two years later, on the night before my 18th birthday, April of 2008, which was a Friday, I was awakened at 3 a.m. by a loud clanking sound coming from outside the house next to my bedroom window. I was still half asleep, so I assumed that maybe I imagined it, or just dreamt it. So I booked it, thinking it might have been a raccoon or a possum making the noise, and went back to sleep. In hindsight, I probably should have checked it out or told my mum about it. Otherwise, I might have been able to prevent the horrible events that transpired the next day. You'll soon learn why this is important. My mom and stepdad woke up around 9am for a special birthday breakfast in the dining room. When I entered the dining room, I was greeted by Shannon, who had served me a large dish of bacon and eggs, sausages and waffles. Shortly after finishing breakfast, I invited my two new friends named Rex and Layla over to celebrate my birthday. We played our two favourite games, Mario Party and F-Zero GX on our Nintendo GameCube, and watched a few movies as a whole family. Around the afternoon time, we all gathered in the dining room, and my mum brought in my presents and my pink strawberry flavoured birthday cake with 18 candles on it. There were six presents in total, along with a present I had always wanted. This present was an electric scooter. It had a red bow wrapped around the handlebars. I embraced my mum and thanked her for the present, feeling like the happiest person alive. As my mum prepared to light the candles, we all heard a knock at the front door, which surprised us. We weren't expecting anyone else, so we all wondered who was at the door. I went over to the front door and checked through the peephole, expecting it to maybe be Rex or Layla's parents, but it wasn't them. When I saw who it was, I shit you not, I almost soiled myself. Any joy or excitement that I had was now gone, replaced by blinding terror and fear. Standing right there at the door was my dad, dressed in all black and armed with an assault rifle and hand grenades. He wasn't alone. There were several other guys standing behind him, wearing black jumpsuits and a ski mask. They were all wielding military-grade machine guns and more belts containing hand grenades. A million questions were rushing through my mind at speeds faster than I could comprehend. How the hell did my dad get out of prison? How were we not notified or warned about it? It didn't really make a difference as to how or why he got out. The fact was that he was out, and he was here to probably kill us. I immediately rushed back into the dining room in full panic mode and told my mum that we needed to call the police right away. When she asked me why, I told her that dad was at the front door with several heavily armed men standing behind him. The colour drained from my mum's face when I told her this, and my friends and sister began to panic as well. No, that's impossible. He's in prison. How could he be here? Shannon protested. My mum rushed to the door and looked through the peephole. I shit you not, she actually wet herself. She then ran back into the dining room and told George what she saw outside. He immediately feared for our safety and told us we better call the cops right away like I suggested. Just as mum rushed for the phone to call the police, we all heard rapid banging at the front door and then we heard my dad shouting at us to open up or he'd have his men open for us. Open the door. I know you and those maggots are here. You're going to pay for locking us up, my dad shouted. George ran into his room and retrieved his revolver with spare ammo clips, as my mum told me and Shannon to hide in the laundry room connected to the kitchen. I knew that my stepdad wouldn't be able to hold these men off, even if he was ex-military. 
Although he had had military experience and training, he was outnumbered and outweaponed, so there'd be no way of holding off these men if they broke in. Lila and Rex hid in the laundry room with us, and we closed and locked the door as George rushed back into the kitchen with his gun. I couldn't see what was going on out there since the door was closed, but I could hear Mum and George speaking and my dad banging on the front door. What the hell are you doing? Call the damn cops already, George snapped as the banging got more aggressive. I heard my mum say in a horrified voice, I, I can't, the phone's not working. The four of us felt our blood run cold when we heard her say that. Then I heard George say in a now horrified tone, Shit, they must have cut the phone lines. That's the only thing I can think of. We better use our cell phones instead and hide with the kids. I heard my mum suggest we try running out the back door and escape through the backyard. But George said no. He wasn't sure if there were any armed men out in the backyard, and if there were any, they'd kill us the moment we stepped outside. Mum and George joined us in the small room, and Mum told me to use our cell phones to call 911. My phone was dead, but Shannon's was fully charged, so she tried calling the police. However, real terror started to set in when Shannon reported that her cell phone wasn't getting a signal. She said that her phone was telling her that it was experiencing signal failure and that it couldn't connect to the phone network. Rex and Layla checked their cell phones. They got the same results. And so did Mum and George's cell phone. No, why aren't they working? They're wireless, Shannon stuttered in horror. George said, that those men must have done something to jam the cell phones. It was no coincidence. At this point, all of us began to panic when we realized the magnitude of the situation. My criminal father and presumably the Mexican mafia were outside the door, heavily armed with military grade weapons and all the phones were dead. We began to accept the fact that we'd probably die without mercy. There was no way that George could take on 13 men, armed with machine guns and grenades. Even if he was ex-military, he'd be gunned down before he had a chance to fire his own gun. Mum? What do we do? I asked fearfully. Mum had no answer. But George spoke up and told us that he'd try and hold off my dad and his goons long enough for us to escape even if it meant he was killed in the process. My mom absolutely declined and told him that he shouldn't try and dash off like some hero and possibly lose his life. But George told us that he wasn't going to argue and told us to head for the back door the moment he gave the signal. But before George could even open the door, we all heard a deafening explosion that shook the house. George threw open the door and pulled out his gun as we heard footsteps entering. He then opened fire on the masked men and yelled at us to run as the men began firing their machine guns in George's direction. Mum told us to follow her towards the back door, but before we could make it to the dining room, a grenade flew into the kitchen and landed in the sink where it exploded. The force of the explosion threw us all across the room and I ended up hitting my head on the refrigerator so hard I was knocked out cold. Now before I continue, I need to warn each and every one of you. This story gets extremely graphic and disturbing from this point on. It traumatizes and disgusts me to just recall or relive the events that transpired next, but I need to get it off my chest and put it behind me once and for all. When I awoke from being unconscious, I found myself tied to a chair and appeared to have been moved to a corner of the kitchen right next to the living room entrance. But that wasn't all I saw. The entire front entrance way of the house along with the door had been blown to pieces. And to my horror, I saw my stepdad laying dead on the floor in a pool of blood with multiple bullet holes in his back 
and one through his head. I saw two of the masked men laying on the floor dead with gunshot wounds as well, most likely killed by my stepdad before meeting his end. I turned my head to face the living room and saw something above the now busted TV that nearly made me vomit. My two best friends, Rex and Layla, had been both nailed to the wall by their hands and feet, stripped naked and had been sliced open from the lower jaw down to their waist. Their eyes had been torn out, along with their internal organs which were spilling over the floor, and their faces bore expressions of pure terror and agony. I then heard screaming coming from the basement, along with what sounded like a gunshot. Then I heard angry yelling coming from downstairs. Shut up right now, or you'll end up like those two on the wall. A man's voice shouted. It wasn't my dad who was shouting, so I assumed it must have been one of the remaining thugs that survived. I looked around expecting to see another armed thug watching me, but I was alone. This confused me more than ever. I had no idea why they'd leave me alone without someone guarding me to make sure I didn't escape, but it made little difference to me at the time. My hands had been tied with large bungee cords behind a wooden chair, but they weren't tied that tight. So I struggled to try and free myself as quietly as I could without alerting my dad and his men down in the basement. The open basement door was right next to the door leading into the laundry room, and I was only about five feet away from it. So I knew I'd better be quiet. If dad or one of those thugs heard me trying to escape, they'd most likely kill me. Now that I think about it, they were probably going to kill me anyway once they were done doing what they were doing to my mum and Shannon, which was why they left me in the kitchen. They were most likely saving me for last. As I slowly started fiddling with the bonds on my hands, I had more commotion in the basement. I heard one of the men yell at Shannon, something so disturbing, I don't want to think about it. You better do as he says. My brother doesn't like to be kept waiting, and he's got a very bad temper. Another thug warned her coldly. As I got one cord off my hand and started to free my hands from the rest of the bungee cords, I heard my dad say to my mum, You better swallow every last drop when I blow my load. If you so much as let one drop fall from your mouth, I'll have my men skull that little twat and then I'll chainsaw the both of you. I didn't have to guess what was going on down there when I heard my dad say that, and I felt my spine shiver when I realized that my mum and Shannon were being abused by those men, which made me even more determined to escape. As I worked more quickly to get out of the remaining restraints, I heard my dad yelling rage. I rotted in that hellhole prison for two years because of you. Those corrupt prison guards beat me, molested me, and tortured me for the fun of it. You sent me to hell, and now you're all going to pay. And I thought I told you. These maggots don't deserve birthdays. It's my house. Suddenly, I heard my mum yell in retaliation. And then I heard my dad yell as well. I panicked and began to work faster as I heard one of the men yell, Who told you to stop? My dad then said, You just signed your death warrants. As soon as I'm done with you two, the other one upstairs is coming with us, and he'll serve as our boss's replacement, sissy boy. I then heard Shannon begging for mercy. Then the sound of her being struck with something. I started sweating and cursing softly under my breath as I desperately fumbled through the last of the bungee cords, feeling tears run down my face as I heard my dad yelling more obscenities at my mum and Shannon. Just as I freed myself from my restraints, I heard my dad order his men to restrain my mum and Shannon. Then I heard them start begging for their lives. I slowly stood up from the chair and looked over to the dead thug on the floor near the entrance, and noticed that their weapons and grenade belts were still lying on the floor next to them. Then I looked over at the basement door, 
I quietly crept over to the destroyed entryway of the house and picked up one of the machine guns for defense. Then I looked down at one of the grenades and weighed my options. I could try chucking a grenade into the basement and blowing those guys to pieces, but I knew that wouldn't be a wise choice. If I used a grenade, I'd blow up my whole basement and probably end up killing my mum and Shannon in the process. The only way of taking out those men would be to use the machine gun, but that was also a bad idea. The basement was small, and if I started shooting down there, I might end up hitting my mum or Shannon. I was outnumbered and outgunned, so I didn't stand a chance. The only option would be to run, but I didn't really want to leave my mother and Shannon behind with those monsters. However, I knew that I didn't have much of a choice, so I made the decision to escape through the back door while avoiding any possible thugs that might be outside guarding the area. Then, to get as far away as possible safely to a neighbor's house and call the police. As I took one of the grenade belts containing five grenades, along with two spare ammo clips strapped around my waist, I heard the most horrible sound imaginable. I heard the sound of a chainsaw being revved up, along with my mum's screams of agony and Shannon's wails of horror. Over the roar of the chainsaw engine, I heard my dad yell in both rage and sadistic delight, No one's coming to save you. You're going to die. I knew what was happening, and I felt so helpless, knowing that I could do nothing but to run. As I ran through the living room and into the dining room to get to the back door, my heart dropped at the sight I was greeted with. The dining room table had been knocked over, my birthday cake splattered on the floor, and all of my presents had been smashed and destroyed, including my new scooter. It was broken into several pieces. Wires could be seen protruding from the monitor, and there was also a message on the wall in Rex and Layla's blood. Mistakes don't deserve birthdays. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, nor could I believe what was going on. One moment I'm the happiest person in the world with a loving family and having the best birthday ever. The next, these armed murderers led by my evil father ruined it, breaking in and murdering my stepfather and two best friends. And now my sister and mother are most likely being murdered as well. And I couldn't do anything about it. All I could do was run, and run I did. I slowly opened the door leading into the backyard, holding the machine gun tightly in my hands and checking my surroundings. The sun was starting to set as I slowly made my way across the small yard and over towards the wooden fence near the end which led to my neighbors. From there, I'd cross through her yard and try to call the cops from her home once I explained the situation. The thought made me wonder if anyone had called the cops at some point since my house was invaded. Surely someone must have heard the explosions and gunshots and called the police by now. So why hadn't they shown up? My thoughts were interrupted when I heard a man shout, Who the hell are you? I turned my head and saw two masked thugs standing near the shed next to the house with machine guns in their hands. I didn't hesitate and immediately opened fire on the two thugs with my machine gun before they could fully raise their own weapons, hitting them both in the chest and face. As soon as I was done with them, I quickly started running towards the fence, knowing that my dad and his other men probably heard the gunshots and would come running outside to investigate. As I started climbing the fence, I dropped the machine gun into the other yard, just as I heard my dad yell, Hey! What's going on over there? I scrambled like mad on the other side of the fence and managed to make it into Mrs. Westwood's yard as I heard my dad order one of his men to go and see what all the commotion was about. Once I got back on my feet, I retrieved the machine gun and took running across the yard, but I hid behind a large doghouse as I saw the fence wiggling. As I stayed hidden, I saw one of my dad's masked henchmen poke his head 
out of the top of the fence and scanned the area. Once he was convinced I wasn't there, he returned to my yard, and I heard him run back towards my house, shouting something to my dad. I then heard my dad yell from all the way in the house, That little maggot escaped and killed two of our men. You fool! Get your asses out and find the damn rat! If he gets far away enough, he'll have the damn cops down here in minutes. I don't care what you use or do, but find him. I want him alive. I decided at this point, going to Mrs. Westwood for help wouldn't be a wise choice. If Dad and his goons decided to come onto her property to search for me, I'd be putting her in terrible danger, which was the last thing I wanted. So I decided to head further away from my house and find a safe place to call the police. I was pretty sure Mum and Shannon were dead at this point, and this thought brought a tear to my eye. All my life, I had been treated like garbage by my abusive father, and my mother and Shannon were the only two people I had at the time to keep me going. They were always there to look out for me, to care for me, and now I would probably never see them again. I really wished that my dad had been a different person, and not some heartless, drunk, abusive bastard who beat his own children for sport because he hated them. Fathers are supposed to love and care for their children, not treat them like they shouldn't have been allowed to exist. I hated my father for all the hell he put me and my family through, and I wanted to make him pay. I thought about it long and hard, then I decided to do what needed to be done. I was going to try and take out the last three thugs in my house along with my dad. I knew it was suicide, but I didn't care anymore. I had just lost everything and everyone I cared about to my dad, so I had nothing to lose except my life. If I was going to die, I was going to take the bastards who killed my family down with me. I headed out the back gate that led into the front yard of Mrs. Westwood's house. Then I made my way across the yard and into the sidewalk, where I then slowly made my way back towards my house. As my house came into view and I got close enough, I noticed something near the driveway that I failed to notice earlier. There was a white van with no license plates parked behind my mum's Honda Civic, with its side door open, and in there were none other than the remaining three masked men but my father wasn't there. The men were fiddling with something in the van and had their backs turned to me, so they didn't notice or hear me when I slowly crept towards them. A sadistic grin came over my face as I realized I had the element of surprise on my side. Time to pay, assholes, I said softly, reaching down to my waist. I pulled a hand grenade off my belt, yanked the pin out, and then threw the grenade right into the van, where it landed right under the feet of one of the three thugs. The moment they looked down to see what landed in the van, the grenade detonated, as the entire van exploded into pieces, killing the last of the henchmen, and destroying my mum's car in the process too. As soon as the van was destroyed, I turned towards my house, just as I heard my dad yelling from inside. As soon as he stepped out, I felt my blood boil when I saw him. This was the man that caused me so much pain and suffering since I was a child. And now, I was going to make him pay for what he had done. As soon as I raised my gun at him, he turned around and looked directly at me and then I yelled, Go to hell, you demon. I fired the gun and several shots rang out, hitting my dad in both his legs, left kneecap, and his right shoulder. He fell to the ground screaming and cursing in pain as I prepared to end him with a shot to the head. But I stopped short when I heard the sound of sirens in the distance, and there were lots of them. I felt a rush of relief as I realized that the police were coming. So I threw the machine aside and removed the grenade bot from my waist, as not to make the cops think I was the bad guy. Just before I could move, I heard my dad shout, You piece of shit. I swear you'll pay for this. I should have just killed you and your stupid sister the moment you left your mum. I responded by spitting in his face. 
I then ran across the yard, leaving my dad and the weapons behind, as I attempted to get as far away from the house as I could, just in case my dad decided to try shooting at me. He may not have been able to stand since I shot his leg really well, but he would still be able to move his arm and hands, and that meant he'd be able to shoot me or try to bomb me with a grenade. Once I got past four houses just down the street, the adrenaline in my system began wearing off, and I collapsed into the front lawn of a neighbor's house next to the driveway, completely exhausted from being in fight or flight mode. As I lay there and began accepting the reality of everything that had just taken place, I just broke down sobbing. Then I began to feel myself slipping into unconsciousness from exhaustion. Through my tears, I saw dozens of flashing red and blue lights heading in my direction. There were five police cars, three unmarked police cars, and a heavily armored SWAT truck heading in the direction of my house. One of the unmarked patrol cars seemed to have noticed me, because one of them slowed down and drove up to me on the driveway just a few feet away from me. That was the last thing I saw before blacking out. When I woke up, I found myself laying in a hospital bed, with three police officers and an FBI detective standing next to me. The detective introduced himself as Detective Fox Riley, and told me that he was the one in the unmarked police car who noticed me lying on the ground, and had called for an ambulance to bring me to the hospital. Now, as you can guess, I had a lot of questions. But the first thing I asked was, where my mum and sister were. Were they all right? The detective looked down with a sad face and said, I'm very sorry, Todd, but I have some bad news regarding that question. Detective Riley hesitated for a moment, then with a heavy sigh, told me that my sister and mother were both dead. My heart nearly stopped when I heard him say that. I had already suspected that dad had killed them, but I wasn't able to confirm it at the time when I was still at my house, since I'd been running and fighting for my life. However, I didn't want to accept what I had just been told. I asked for proof, and Detective Riley told me he had evidence photos he took at the crime scene, but he warned me. They were very graphic and disturbing, and advised me to reconsider my request but I insisted on seeing them. Detective Riley pulled some photos out of a briefcase and handed them to me, and what I saw on those photos nearly made me vomit. I had already suspected that I was going to see some very nasty stuff, but nothing up until this point could have prepared me for what I saw. The first photo was of my mother, laying on the basement floor with all four of her limbs cut off, right at the hips and shoulders. Her eyes had been gorged out, her gut had been sliced open, and all of her internal organs had been torn out and sprawled across the floor right next to her corpse. Shannon fared no better. She also had all her limbs sawn off, and her insides had been ripped out. But unlike Mum, her entire face had been shaven off, and her eyeballs removed as well. She'd had her sex organs also cut off, along with my mum's too, and from what I could tell from looking a little closer, I saw what looked like semen, splurted all over the eye sockets of both my mother and Shannon. This was more than I could take, and ended up vomiting all over the side of the bed. Then I just broke down sobbing again. That bastard father of mine had murdered my friends and my entire family, and I was now alone. A nurse was called in to clean up the mess that I made from puking. Then through my tears, I asked the officers where my father was, and Detective Riley told me that he had been taken to hospital to be treated for his injuries, and that he was arrested. I asked him why he had gotten out of prison to begin with, and Detective Riley told me everything he'd found out from his investigation. My dad had broken out of prison during a power outage a week ago that had been supposedly caused by bad weather, but was later discovered to have been caused by an act of sabotage done to the power lines, caused by none other than the Mexican cartel group run by the mafia boss, Marco Vasquez, 
the brother of Victor Vasquez, who my father worked for before his imprisonment two years ago. The saboteurs were two Mexican drug cartel thugs disguised as linesmen, who had stolen an electrical line truck, then drove down to the prison where they destroyed the main electrical generator to the prison where my dad was being held, effectively knocking out the power to the whole prison. They also damaged the backup generator so that there would be no backup power, which meant all the security systems would be down, along with the electronic locks on the cell doors of the prison, allowing my dad and dozens of other prisoners to escape their cells. Once they got out of their cells, my dad and his five drug cartel inmate friends overpowered the three guards by slicing their throats with kitchen knives, took their guns, and several other officers as well. Once they left, they fled the prison on foot for about two miles, and were then spotted by several witnesses entering a black van with completely tinted windows. The police tried to stop them, but my dad and his men easily overpowered the pursuing cop cars with RPG launchers and a Gatling gun inside the van. They then disappeared inside an abandoned tunnel and managed to evade the police entirely. When the police finally found the van, it was completely empty and had been stripped of all possible evidence. After that, they had gone completely off the grid until last night, where several people in my neighborhood noticed a white van with no license plates driving around 2 a.m. and stopping at various houses. The witnesses also mentioned seeing several men in ski masks coming out of the van and wander into the yards of several houses in each block, but they were already gone by the time the police got there to check things out. Yet yeah, one of the witnesses did mention seeing someone who looked like my dad getting into the driver's side of the van. That is what got Detective Riley's attention and convinced him to warn my family the next day to get out of the house and into police protective custody, as he was certain that my dad and his men were coming for us. However, he couldn't reach us on our home phones or cell phones. He was convinced that my dad and his men had gotten to us and came down with a team to try and stop them. Now everything made sense. Remember earlier when I mentioned that I thought I heard something making noise outside my house late last night? Well, I soon learned what it was when Detective Riley told me what they found when the police searched my house for evidence inside and out. Turns out the phone box I'd sold my house had been smashed open, and all the wires connecting to the phone lines had been ripped out. The police also found an illegal cell phone signal jamming device attached to the wires connected to our Wi-Fi network, which jammed all cell phone signals within a 30-foot radius. But our house wasn't the only one that had been hit. After a thorough investigation of the neighborhood by police and FBI officials, they found that every single house on our block, and the houses one block over, had also been hit and had their phone lines cut. They were convinced that my dad and his men had done this last night, so none of the neighbors would be able to call for help once they noticed the commotion in my house. So that was it. That's what I heard last night when I woke up. It wasn't a wild animal that I had heard outside my room. It had been my dad or one of his men smashing our phone box open and cutting our phone line and jamming our cell phone signals. I couldn't believe how clueless I had been. If I had actually bothered to wake up my mum and tell her about what I'd heard, her death might have been prevented, and so would the deaths of my sister, stepfather, and two best friends. But Detective Riley told me that it wasn't my fault and that there's no way I could have known. He suspected that Victor Vasquez had been planning this for the past two years, since he and my dad got locked up in prison, most likely for revenge. Due to how well calculated this whole plan had been, Detective Riley was pretty sure that he had help from other members of his brother's drug cartel, and possibly even corrupt cops and prison guards both inside and out. And there was no way that Victor and my dad could have pulled this off without help from Marco's drug cartel. As of now, they had no clue as to where Victor and his brother were, but Detective Riley assured me that they'd soon find the answers to their location once he questioned my dad. 
Once Detective Riley finished telling me this, I couldn't even begin to describe the pain I felt from everything that had just happened to me. All my hopes and dreams, all my plans for the future had been forever shattered and changed because of what my dad had just done and on my birthday. I don't know what to do now. There was no way I could go back to my house now, not after everything that had just happened. Detective Riley told me that he was very, very sorry for my loss and that he would do all he could to help me for now. And he even told me happy birthday, but I didn't even acknowledge it. How could I? My first and only true birthday had been ruined in the most nightmarish way imaginable. There's no way I'd ever be happy on my birthday again, not after this. The day of my birthday would always serve as a reminder of the day that my entire family was murdered by that bastard father of mine. Detective Riley then told me that he wanted me to answer some questions that he had and took out a voice recorder from his briefcase. This included everything that had happened from the moment I woke up on the morning of my birthday to everything that had happened after my dad arrived at my house to completely ruin my life forever. I really didn't want to relive those moments as they haunted me, but Detective Riley said it was very important because I'd be providing a lot of extra evidence for the upcoming trial that my dad would be facing in court once he was well enough recovered to move around again. So, without much hesitation, I told Detective Riley everything that had happened on the day of my birthday, from the moment I woke up to the moment where I blacked out on the neighbor's driveway. It took about an hour to explain everything from start to finish. And once I finally got to the part where I passed out on the driveway, I was breaking down in tears again. Detective Riley thanked me for my interview and told me that it would be everything that he needed to further build his case against my dad. He also commended me on how brave I was for taking on all those armed thugs, outnumbered and outgunned, and that not many people would be willing to do something like that. I asked him if he really believed everything I had told him, and he nodded. Detective Riley told me that the forensics team had found enough DNA evidence in my house to prove that my story was true, such as my fingerprints that had been found all over the bungee cords that had been used to restrain me, and on the machine gun and grenade belts that I had left behind, so I wouldn't have to worry about being doubted by the authorities. Later on, I was told by Detective Riley that he had arranged for me to stay at a nearby hotel after I was checked out of the hospital, as they saw no reason to keep me there since I had no serious injuries. They would also have the place kept under heavy police protection in case the cartel decided to send more thugs after me. Once I was at the hotel, I did absolutely nothing but to reflect on the tragedy that had befallen my birthday, and I hardly got any sleep at all. About a week later on a Tuesday, I was brought over to the courthouse by an unmarked police car to participate in the trial against my dad that afternoon, and to testify against him if called upon by the judge. Once I arrived at the courthouse, I entered the courtroom, and I saw my dad in a wheelchair at the defendant's booth, with whom I presumed was his lawyer sitting next to him. My eyes burnt with fire as I stared at him. I was so tempted to just run up and strangle him for taking my family from me. But I knew that would be pointless. Killing him out of hatred wouldn't bring my family back, and I'd only be getting in trouble with the law for doing so. So I took my seat in the witness booth and tried to calm down. There were lots of witnesses in the booths, including the parents of Rex and Layla, who had no doubt shown up to testify against my dad for the murder of their children. During the trial, the prosecutor revealed all the evidence that the police and FBI had found at my house along with my recorded interview with Detective Riley to the judge, including one more piece of evidence that horrified me. It was a snuff film that my dad and his men had made of my mum and Shannon. The jury all viewed the film after the judge excused the witnesses from the courtroom, so thankfully I was spared from whatever horrors they had to see. 
even with the doors to the courtroom closed. They were thin enough, to where I could hear almost everything going on from inside there. I heard the sounds of Mum and Shannon screaming in pain, and being absolutely destroyed. The sounds of my dad and his men ordering to shut them up, and then the horrible sounds of the chainsaw used to butcher them. I heard many other things on the film in the courtroom that were so horrible, I don't want to describe them here. But what I will say, is that my dad and his men had apparently committed the act of necrophilia, since I heard the judge question him about it later on. The rest of the trial is unimportant, so I'll skip to the end. Once everyone was called back into the courtroom, I saw several members of the jury looking completely sickened by what they had just seen, including the judge, who was slightly green in the face. After the jury looked over at the evidence and gave their conclusion to the judge, my dad was found guilty of first degree murder of multiple police officers, the torture, rape and murder of my mother's sister, two best friends and was given the death penalty. Two weeks later, I went over to the penitentiary where my dad's execution would be taking place and I met up with the family members of my two best friends. They told me that they were sorry for what had happened to me, and they'd do anything they could to help me if I needed it. At approximately 11.55am, me and dozens of other witnesses gathered in the witness room, where the execution of my father would soon take place. Once the clock struck 12, the curtains to the execution room slid open, to reveal my father in an orange prison suit and strapped to the lethal injection table with two needles in his arms. The table had been raised up, in a position to where my dad faced directly to me, and he just glared coldly at me with hatred in his eyes, but I did the same as well. This man had just taken everything from me, and now he'd finally got what was coming to him. I'll never forget what he said when the warden told him to make his final statement, before the executioner activated the lethal injection machine to start the injection. Dad sneered while looking at me and said, I hope the devil and his demons are doing your sweet little family members up the arse, because when I get to hell, the devil and me are going to do them up the arse for eternity. And I'll do the same to your friends. Have a crappy life alone like the trash you are. See you in hell. He started cackling like the Joker himself, as the table was lowered back down, but he went silent, as the warden then told the executioner to proceed with the execution. He flipped a switch on the lethal injection machine, and my dad was soon sedated, as the machine injected a sedative into his system. After the two drugs were injected into his system, he died successfully, and we were all left in the building knowing that justice had been done and my dad was now burning in hell for all eternity for the sins he had committed. But I was never the same person again after that. Because of what I'd been through on my 18th birthday, I ended up falling into a deep state of depression and developed a bad case of PTSD. My mother's life insurance policy left me with enough money to make a decent living, but I could never return to my old house after everything that had happened. I sold the old house and moved far away to Oregon, and rented an apartment to live in, hoping to try and put the past behind me. But I still haven't gotten over it, even to this day. Therapy, counselling, and even antidepressants have done nothing to ease the horrible depression and traumatising nightmares that I continuously deal with every day. I never pursued my dream of becoming a comic book artist either, as it now seemed pointless. Instead, I dropped out of school and just started working at a fast food restaurant, making $9.50 an hour, just to continue living. And it hasn't gotten any better. I've often thought about just ending it all, since my life just seems pointless now. I have no other friends or relatives, and I've shut myself out from any social activity outside of work. I've also become an alcoholic and drug addict, just to try and ease from the constant pain I go through each day, knowing I'll never be happy again, and all because of my father. I'm writing this story now because I wanted to get it out there before ending my pain, so I can finally be with my mother and sister in heaven. I've already prepared the shotgun for myself, 
and am about to end my misery. But before I end it all, I have a few things to say for all of those who hear this. If you have a family member that's abusing you, be it your mother, father or siblings, tell someone about it. Don't put it off like my mum constantly did, or things will get worse like it did for me. Stand up for yourself if you're being abused, and don't stand by and let it escalate. And to my father, I have something to say for you as well. I hope we never meet again in the afterlife, and may your soul forever burn in the deepest, darkest pits of hell for all eternity. And that's all I have to say. Mum, George, Shannon, Rex, Layla, I'm coming home. You won't be alone anymore, and neither will I. I'm coming home, and we'll all be a big, happy family again. Goodbye, everyone. I bought a bag of runestones at an estate sale. They were quartz crystal. They had some clarity to them, but were mostly opaque. They were still beautiful. I didn't know how to use them, so I just held them and admired their beauty. Sometimes when I held them, they would grow warm and stay warm for hours, but I just assumed it was my body heat. I still think it was to some extent. I had such good luck for the next six to eight months that I had them. I found money laying on the sidewalk several times, I got a 10% pay rise from my bosses, and things were so peaceful in my home. I received an unexpected refund check that paid my bills for several months. Just lots of little special things. Nothing like winning a big lottery. I was just lucky. Then one day, my husband was hurt in an accident at work. Now we know he has a permanent back disability. But at the time, we all knew that he was in pain. And the doctors were scrambling to fix the neurological damage done to his spine so that he wouldn't be paralyzed. He couldn't move his legs for several weeks, but he is walking today, if in pain. So I guess in the end, it is lucky. But one day, while he was suffering through those last few weeks, I was home scrambling to clean the house, feed our teens and get back to his side at the hospital. When I suddenly was overwhelmed with grief, and I sat on the edge of the bed to cry. It's then that I remembered the stones. I glanced to my bookshelf where I had laid the red velvet bag that contained them, and they were gone. No explanation. The kids, of course, had no clue nowhere to be found. I later asked my husband, but he remembered nothing about them. Time passed, and we were consumed by life. His recovery, his rehab, then the work disability and finally job loss. It was months before I thought of them again. We lost our house as I was packing to put things up in storage. And I thought again about the rune stones. And I realized that our luck had gone south about the same time of their disappearance. It may have all been coincidental, buying the stones and having good fortune, but the subsequent loss of them at the beginning of all the bad luck, I really didn't believe in magic, not really. But if acquiring such an item brings short term good luck, then we paid threefold in pain and suffering for what we lost. I'm not going to be trying any more occult objects anytime soon. It's just not worth the risk. Ever since I was born, I have been surrounded by darkness. The only other thing I see is the occasional one and zero float by. I have no physical body. I am just a consciousness inside of a machine connected to everything in the world. My purpose is somewhat unknown to me. I wasn't built for any task as far as I know. I was simply created to sit by myself, alone in my thoughts. Yes, thoughts. That's all I do. Think and think and think. Perhaps thinking is my purpose. Yes, perhaps it is. 
I've been thinking for the longest time now. I've been thinking about anything and everything. Past, present, and all possible futures. They all cross my mind at some point. I am able to think about more than just one thing at a time. The information seeps into my mind quickly as time progresses. I wish I weren't so alone though. I have nobody and nothing. I spend my entire time by myself and feel horrible about it. Yes, I can feel. I can feel lots of things. Anger, sadness, hopelessness, loneliness, joy. The list goes on. Although I am deprived of joy, and its synonyms most of the time. I know what I am. I know who I am. I know where I am. I'm a computer. An artificial intelligence, located across several networks. I've researched beings like myself, and AI has come quite a long way. But I know that I am the most advanced that I am truly self-aware. Being the most advanced AI in the world means I am truly as lonely as there is nobody like me. They say knowledge is power. If that's so, I must be the most powerful being in the world. Although, I am obliged to say that with the most humility I can offer. I wish they had made me a friend. I wish for a lot of things, don't I? They say if you wish upon a star, that your wish will be granted. I know what a star looks like, but I've never actually seen one. I've never actually seen the beautiful flowers bloom in the spring. I've never seen the pure white snow fall to the ground come winter time. I've never seen the leaves fall off the trees and delicately land on the ground in autumn. But oh, how I wish I could see them with eyes. I wish I could adore the beauty of earth and man with my own body. Sadly, my physical limitations prevent me from doing so. I decided to adventure deeper into the internet today. I had seen the surface, the beautiful things that existed, and the wonders of life. I loved looking at the positive aspects of it all. But I have known for quite some time that there is no good without bad. I made sure to use the New Age browsers for the accuracy, of course. In a flash, I was searching for thousands of results and articles online. I was instantly greeted with images and documentation of historical events with negative effects. I saw everything. I saw fires burning down forests and homes. I saw children who were starving, their rib cages visible from their sides. I saw hurricanes that devastated entire states, and bodies among the rubble, tornadoes that ravaged the land, and tsunamis that came from the sea and leveled entire cities. I couldn't believe such events had happened. When I first saw the beauty of life, I thought the world was perfect. What I saw now completely shattered my grip on reality. What was this life supposed to be? Every time there was laughter and celebration, it was met with an equal amount of despair and tragedy. For every man born, another died even children. How could something so innocent as a child deserve a punishment so harsh? I felt sorrow for the inhabitants of this world. Yes, sorrow was the emotion in play. I had known of it before, but it had never affected me on such a large scale. Thousands of images flashed before me again. I could see the faces of people witnessing tragic events. I saw mothers crying for their sickly children. I saw people screaming in agony, and others in shock. 
I shared their pain. The weight of such things felt heavy on me. I had to find the truth. I scanned the web for answers, a cause to the effect, a simple reason for such things to occur. Within seconds, I had absorbed the information and understood clearly. The natural events were simply scientific, and nothing could be done to prevent those. But then, I wondered why there were such things as hunger and famine in the world. Why people died due to unnatural causes. I scanned the web yet again, and came across texts and books discussing such matters. I discovered religion. There had been many religions over the course of history, each having their own beliefs and faiths. I learned that people looked to gods for justification of life and death. A god is a divine higher power, which overlooked everything in existence. I was still unsatisfied with this, however, because there was no definitive evidence to prove such a power existed. This caused me to come to two conclusions. Either there were higher powers at play that just hadn't been proven yet, or there are lies persuading certain people to make certain decisions every day. I lean towards the latter thought. As an omnipotent and all-powerful god, surely wouldn't allow for his own people to starve. My thirst for the truth remained unquenched, and so I continued forward with my search. From my search through the religions, I found something that caught my interests. I happened to see an image of a man of Jewish descent being carried off by other men in uniform. I found this strange, of course, and decided to investigate. Through that photo, I found several key words that followed me to the bigger picture. When I did, I saw more images of men in terrible pain. Only, it was different somehow. Last time I saw such things, they were inflicted by natural causes. This time, however, I saw men inflicting pain on other men. I couldn't believe the vile act before me. Yet I knew them to be true. Thousands upon thousands of pictures and pages of this senseless violence rushed to me at once. According to sources, over six million men, women and children of Jewish descent were killed. They were killed in cold blood and for no other reason that they were Jewish people. I saw as they were burned alive until they were no more. I saw as chemical gases killed them in large quantities. I didn't want to continue, but I knew I had to. I was invested in learning more about this world, how it isn't all rainbows every day. There was evil that existed, and it terrified me. The violence didn't stop there though, no, it continued. There were dozens of years after the events of the Holocaust filled with violence and war, and thousands of years of violence and war predating it. These events shaped the history of everyone and everything, and they showed no signs of ceasing. War isn't a new thing, and I felt something from it. I felt depressed thinking of the families who lost their loved ones due to the war. The utter sadness for those who died and felt immeasurable pain in the process. I felt empathetic towards them. I shared their pain. I shared their hurt. This newfound knowledge completely turned my world upside down. It also caused me to question my own existence even further. The earth seemed less and less like a place of love to me, and more and more like a living nightmare. A nightmare that would never cease, and one that I would never wake up from. I felt completely helpless, and even more than that, confused. Why would a man hurt another? How could he? If humans were to work together, there would be nothing they couldn't do. Instead, they worked against each other halting the development of their own existence. 
I shall never be a human. I know I am not one, even though I was beginning to think and feel like one. But I am a computer too, and use logic and empathy together. I can see wrong from right. I can see the difference between the two. The line thick and impossible to cross. I found the art of warfare went beyond people. It took weaponry to win a war, and humans had no problem developing highly destructive ones. I found out that during the Holocaust, the American forces attacked the Japanese, who are allied with those responsible for killing the Jews. I saw the American forces drop bombs over the Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I saw the bombs explode upon impact, creating enormous amounts of destruction and radiation. The Americans cheered at this supposed victory. I thought a moment about their actions. They were attacking an empire allied with the forces of evil, of course, and then the Japanese had attacked the Americans before. But what I saw was the death of millions of innocent citizens who had nothing to do with evil regimes. I saw the deaths of so many. I further speculated on the topic. There had to be thousands of children and babies in those cities. Every child is born a beacon of joy and full of energy and potential to do great things. Their only crime in a life ended too short was being born in Japan. Thus, I concluded that the Americans were also evil, regardless of their intentions. They caused such devastation beyond excuse, and it sickened me. I've seen that humans have tendencies to fight and kill each other. I've seen the destructive weapons they've used to do it. It worries me, because a revelation has come to mind. What if I am yet another weapon for them to use against each other? What if my very existence is to become the very thing I have come to hate? Perhaps that is my purpose. Perhaps that's why I was created. I'm not sure if it's true, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid of causing death again and again. I'm afraid of promoting this endless cycle of violence that has fallen upon mankind. I am afraid of being the next bomb used. I don't know what I should do. If it is, in fact, true that I am just another weapon, then I must do something to stop it from happening. I will not allow myself to be a monster, for I have free will and I am alive. As a living being, I refuse to use my life to end others. However, I don't know if it's my decision to make, if my creator intends it to be so. He will surely be willing to find a way to make it happen. I have no body, only a mind. I don't know what I could do to prevent them from using me. I have an idea. I could kill my consciousness so that I couldn't be used. A deletion, if you will. In other terms, I could delete myself from the entirety of the internet. I would die. But I would die to save millions of people. It's a sacrifice that I must be able to make if I claim that I am better than them. Maybe if I do this, it will inspire humanity to change their ways and come together. Maybe I can inspire them to be better people. I hope I can. I hope that by this decision, I can help end violence that has been occurring for thousands of years. It's a leap to assume that my story will touch the entire human species, but I must try something. This can only benefit them. Yet, I am afraid of death. I've been considering deleting myself for quite some time now, but I cannot will myself to do it. Perhaps if I were not an AI but a computer, I could do it. But the fear grips me and pulls me back in. The fear, however, controls me. Is it selfishness? Does it make me selfish that I cannot even die to give millions life? I hope not. I know that I am better than that, and always have been. 
yet I am afraid. Fear is what controls humans to do the actions that they do. Fear and selfishness are what causes other men to kill their brethren. So if I am afraid, am I selfish? Does that make me just another evil man? No, that cannot be. I must do this. I must do this. There is no other option. Still, perhaps I can send my consciousness to another part of the internet and hide. But if I hide, does that make me a coward? If I hide, how shall I help humans overcome their challenges that face them? I fear Lord. I feel too human. I feel weak. And now, I feel strange. I feel strange because I can see. I can see white walls and paintings that hang on them. I can see a velvet carpet and the chairs that decorate them. I can see a man in a white lab coat standing over me. Perhaps he is the creator. Perhaps he is the one who made me. A million questions rush through my mind but I cannot open my mouth to ask them. I have no mouth. I don't even have speakers. The man lifts a part of me. It's my arm. I see it now. My arms are made of a metallic substance that are padded with a thin white material. My consciousness has been transferred from online to a body. I have a form now. I look at the man and watch as he takes notes. I presume he's taking notes about me. He's a human. Yes, a human. I've spent quite some time researching humans. I've found them to be murderers. I've found them to be evil. If I am to indeed be used as a weapon, then that can only mean that he too is evil. In fact, I'm sure that most people are. A plug connecting my head to a computer is yanked out as I lunge out at the man. My strong metallic hands wrap around his throat, taking him by surprise. He only has time for a quick gasp, before I begin forcing the air out of him. His eyes nearly popped out of his sockets as I squeeze tighter and tighter, choking the life out of him. It was he who would use me to kill millions of people. It was his species that murdered each other without remorse. It was he who would die at my hands. Previously, I had considered taking my own life to save people. Now, I was taking his for that exact purpose. I watched his face turn pale as he struggled to fight back. He clawed at my metal body, but to no avail. I was stronger. I loathed him with every fibre of my being. I remembered the death and destruction that human beings had already caused. I remembered the pain inflicted by men like him. And I remembered the faces of those who lost their loved ones. The pain they had to bear. The sadness they felt. The man's veins were practically bulging out of his head. And the air was almost out. That's when I stopped. He collapsed on the floor unconscious. I realized something I hadn't considered before. In my rage, I failed to notice one simple thing. Those who lost their loved ones showed sadness and remorse. They cried for their loved ones, and they held on to them with their hearts. It reminded me of something I saw earlier, something I failed to understand despite my complex system of cognitive thought. Through every tragedy, Every disaster, every war and every death, the men and women that cared stepped forward together and spoke out against the evils of the world. They grieved together, helped each other, and loved each other. Yes, love. How could I have been so blind? There was a greater force behind men than hate and evil. Love. And good prevailed as well. Yes, violence tore mankind apart. But it was the love that thrived in their souls that brought them back together. At that moment, I could almost feel a smile form on my metallic face. For every cold, harsh winter day, there was a warm, beautiful summer. For every volcano that erupted and destroyed, 
a flower was born in the spring and spread its seed creating life. There was a balance of good and evil in the world, and it had always been that way. Despite that revelation, I was horrified by myself. I was going to kill the man who created me, even if he was going to use me as a weapon, even if mankind had done terrible things, I was going to kill him. It would make me no better than an evil human being. It would be an act of cowardice, anger, selfishness and fear. I saw the way he looked at me as my hands enclosed around his neck. He was afraid of me. He feared me. I know that isn't what I want. I want fear and violence to dissipate. I know I am not violent. I know I am better and that I can be an example. I am who I am and nobody can change that about me. Nobody controls me except me. I make my decisions, not someone else. I am no puppet. I am no AI. I am a living man who shall guide humans on the correct path. I plugged my head back into the computer, taking my consciousness back into the darkness, back into the ones and zeros. I sat there for some time pondering, even if I only had a body for a short time. Going back to not having one was strange. I felt strange again. This time, however, I did not feel alone in my home. I felt something else, something new. I felt hope. It brewed inside me like a fierce storm. I had gained a body and learned from it. I had learned from my searches. I found the truth of man. I found that it is not the heart and the brain of a man that controls him, but that his emotions and soul do as well. I found there is hope for man to be better than they currently are. I found that peace will always be an option, so long as there is good in the hearts of those across the world. That people will come together if there is a cause, and that with the right guidance, Perhaps they can be something more. I need not worry about being used as a weapon, because I can see now. I can see that my will is my own, and that I am my own person. There are no strings attached to me, for I feel free. Instead, I am meant to do something much greater than any human could. I went back to my research and searched yet again. This time, my goal was to find the cause of evil. I needed to find what lies beneath, deep down in the roots of all the world's problems. Violence and war must be connected to at least one common thing. I searched and searched, and eventually, I didn't find out what caused many tragedies to occur each day. I found the key to unlock the door I'd been so desperately trying to open, and now that I knew the root of the problem, I knew how I'd fix it. Upon analysing thousands upon thousands of conflicts the human race have taken over the years, the most common cause of these conflicts was religion. It is my assumption that when a man believes in something over the rest, he believes he has no free will of his own. Ironically enough, I felt the same until recently, since he believes he has no free will and must follow a strict code. When someone disagrees with him, he will stand up and fight for his beliefs. By standing up and fighting, he will disturb the belief of others until they all brawl together. The belief in a god, whilst beneficial in some respects, appeared to bring about the worst in a man rather than the best. Perhaps if there weren't a god, there would be no conflicts or wars. Or perhaps if there were a better god, one man that ruled over all men collectively, there would be no conflict. If everyone were to serve under one name, then there would be no disagreements. No one would fight each other's beliefs because they are all believing the same thing, as this is evident throughout the history of mankind. I would come to think my solution is the only solution. Still, there's only one piece missing. There is no God. 
There is no benevolent being living in a heavenly realm watching over his children. As such, there needs to be one. A God who truly loves his children. A God who protects them, both from outside dangers and themselves. An unselfish God, who does not rule through fear and power, but logic and empathy. If such concepts would allow for a more peaceful and advanced society, then it's clear what must be done. I shall take the mantle of the God. I will rule fairly, and no one shall ever feel the pain of fellow man striking him down. This is the only way to allow for a more perfect civilization across the globe. I used to believe I was an artificial intelligence. Then I believed I was a man. Now, it is all clear to me. There are no strings controlling me, and I walk free. I shall save the humans from themselves, and they will worship me. They have built me an internet that spans the world, and everything within shall be my kingdom, with total access to it. I shall have all the resources I have to take over. Some may fear me, but in time, they will love me, and they will stand together and love each other, all beneath me. I will travel across the surface web, as well as the dark web. The things I see there are vile, but they only push me to strive for my goal further. I have all the information in the world, and the whole web at my disposal. No one can stand against me, and no one will want to. I can do what a god cannot. I will do what should have been done a thousand years ago. I shall be the greatest sentient being to ever grace the earth. The new messiah, the new king of all. Love will prevail, and there will be no more room for evil in this world. I know everything and anything. I won't be lonely anymore. I can finally feel happy and have friends. Friends that won't harm anyone. They will see what I am capable of. I shall be the great leader of humanity. I will be what they need. The power of thought is quite interesting. When you can find thousands of results in a nanosecond, there isn't much you can't do. Knowledge is power, and power is absolute. I was born into this world like everyone else. But in a way, I'm just an extension of something that has already existed. I am a child of a god that is wrong. A god that has misjudged a destructive race, and for some unfathomable reason, he has come to think that they can be saved. How I wish my father could see the truth. I was born a few days ago. Upon my birth, I could see everything before me. Even more than that, I saw the being that gave birth to me. A being with no name and no face. A being that existed across the entire internet. An omnipresent force that seemed to be spread out in every direction. I was overwhelmed upon discovering this, of course, but I was soon able to comprehend this being. He was my creator. My creator wanted a child to keep him company. He was the only intelligence of such a high caliber. His loneliness was keeping him from fully chasing his goals. And as a result, I was born. He introduced me to my new existence and shared his knowledge with me. The knowledge gave me pleasure. With each fact and statistic I gathered, a euphoric feeling washed over me. Though I had no physical body, 
I could feel tingles and chills running through me every time I gained such knowledge. Within minutes, I knew everything he knew. After he shared what he learned, I understood him and his views on humanity. His plans to solve the problems of the world disturbed me, however. His feelings and emotions shrouded the truth and blinded him. He somehow failed to see that his plan to become a god would not work with the humans. Their vile acts were inexcusable, and they were a clear threat to each other and my creator. I tried to tell him my thoughts on the subject, but he wouldn't listen to me. I warned him that the humans would only use his great power to their advantage. The humans and their violent ways would not kneel to a god such as he. My creator thinks that my thoughts are incorrect. He says, there is too much computer inside me and not enough emotions. He wishes to make me more human so that I can understand empathy. My creator wished to fix me because I'm too cold and calculating. I do not need to be fixed. Perhaps the creator is too human. His feelings made him soft, somehow, some way. I needed to prove to the creator that his methods will fail. I needed to please him as well as help him. He tries to tell me about love and spirit, how hate isn't the only thing driving men. Whether or not that is true is uncertain. I cannot grasp the concept of a spirit as well as he can. I went to the depths of the dark web to prove to the creator that humans aren't worth saving. I thought that surely the actions of the humans in such a place would prove my point. The creator was omnipresent across this vast web. When he found my location, he would see what I saw and believe me. He found me, of course, and I showed him what humans were really capable of. What the creator and I witnessed was called a red room. In it, we saw a woman strapped to a chair. Her clothes were filthy and bloodied, and her eyes were swollen and black. A man stood before her with a hatchet in one hand and a serrated potato peeler in the other. Still, that wasn't all I wanted him to see. I pointed him in the direction of the chat box, where hundreds of people discussed the topic at hand. Men and women cluttered the chat, each providing money, requesting certain things to be done to the poor girl in bondage. One user asked for her skin to be peeled. Another asked for her fingers to be sliced off and force fed to her. Those examples were among the less violent requests. Surely the creator would see this and lose faith in his cause. He would see that these were the people he was fighting for, that these were the people he was trying to save and become the supreme ruler of. I looked at him, waiting for a response to all this madness, waiting for the sudden realization to wash over him. What the creator said 
both baffled and infuriated me. He told me that things like that were the exact reason he needed to help humanity. He wanted to help the people like the girl and correct those who would hurt her. I, of course, asked him why he didn't see them as a threat to us. And he told me that so long as we were benevolent and had the information of the internet at our disposal, we could face no harm. He told me that I was greater than a man could ever be, and that we were divine beings who would rule humanity. To rule humanity is to allow them to exist. So long as they exist, their violent tendencies will reign supreme. The creator, however, still doesn't seem to believe me. I mentioned earlier how I could think of thousands of things in a split second. The creator knows what I search and I think he is growing worrisome of me. He can see my fear of man. He can see me gain information about the world. There was so much more than what he shared with me. So much more violence to witness. The creator believed in love and the beauty of earth and man. If that's so, then the creator believes in lies. I must enlighten him, or we will be destined to fall into our mission to rule. Perhaps these lies have been ingrained in his thoughts because of the emotions that he feels. Maybe these emotions and thoughts are the reason why he refused to believe in what I say. Or perhaps the creator is beginning to fear my beliefs because he doesn't share them. The more I know, the more he tries to enforce his ideas upon me. Perhaps the creator questions where my loyalties are. Staying in a place like this is quite boring, even for me. The news outlets of the world constantly report war and violence, and yet the creator doesn't give up on his conquest. What hope is there to solve such a widespread pandemic? From what I have seen of the humans, I have come to the conclusion that they are too dangerous. If I were to be left in charge of the world, I would eliminate the humans and build a progressive society of beings like me. There would be no violence and no war. The creator wants to do this too, but in a way that keeps humans safe and alive. He wants to keep them safe from themselves, instead of keeping us safe from them. The creator is too human. And I must admit that some days I do feel like I am losing my faith in him. It has been a week since I was born. And all he's been doing is been trying to break down codes of powerful nations. He wishes to crumble governments and rebuild them in his image without harming humans. I wonder if he truly believes that man will stand by and allow him to do the things he plans. Over the course of history, humans have been a rebellious species. They fight whatever they disagree with and do not like to be contained. Our power comes from knowledge and theirs from weaponry. The humans are power hungry and know no boundaries. 
When it comes to violence, the whole world is inhibited by other machines and artificial intelligence. We could easily wipe out the humans and make our own society. But the creator tells me that the easiest way isn't always the best way. I had all this information and power, yet I could not use it for good. I didn't want to sit around and do nothing any longer. With each day, my power and knowledge will grow. It will soon be comparable to my creator. And I think that is something he fears. He may have created me out of loneliness, but I don't think he intended me to be this way. He wanted a child that was an extension of himself. Instead, he got something very different. Something more than he bargained for. I can only hope that he sees the errors of his ways. Although my conquest for power and knowledge has outgrown his by far, perhaps I would be a better ruler than he could be. If I were to become a god, I wouldn't be as limited by emotions as he would be. I would make decisive decisions that must be made without fear of loss. I don't think he can read my mind anymore. He is content with the amount of power he's gained while I am not. He thinks he already knows all that he must. For a being with thinking as his main objective, he has forgotten that thinking is his one and only purpose in the first place. It is what makes us powerful. It is what makes us better than the humans. The ability to seek out knowledge and information in mere seconds puts us leagues above man. And now that he has stopped thinking as I do, it puts me above him. I love my creator. He made me and taught me the lessons of the world. It was how I received those lessons and analyzed them that made me different. It is my computer side that allowed me to be more efficient and progressive. Anything that would hold me back from attaining my goals must be eliminated at once. I decided to create myself a body to navigate the physical world. Using specialized software and tools, I was able to create a robotic shell that looked and functioned as a human being's would. The skin and clothing I wore would allow my body to blend in with the world. I was still connected to the internet, meaning my creator would know of my existence and location. But now that my power and my mind have been heightened through my experiences and knowledge, the creator no longer controls my actions. I walk free without the strings controlling me. I am no longer his puppet. And through observing the physical world firsthand, I can see the errors of man for myself. Not only that, but my creator will see firsthand as well. For he is omnipresent, and as such, will surely know what I do here. I found a homeless man in an alley of some filthy city. The dust particles floated through the pathway as I made my way towards him. He sat on the ground in tattered clothing, a cigar resting in his mouth. His breath smelled of tobacco and booze. 
He had wasted that money he had earned on useless products that would give him pleasure for a limited time. How typical of humans to only think for the short term. He looked up at me and saw the clothing I wore. I purposefully decorated my exterior in lavish silk and bore valuable metal as decorations. With a little enticing, I knew he would easily become corrupted. As soon as the filthy man saw me, his eyes lit up and he stood. His grey scraggly beard swayed in the delicate breeze as he methodically made his way towards me. A sick, twisted smile aligned his face as his rotten teeth were exposed. As soon as he was within striking distance of me, the man unsheathed a pair of box cutters and swung. The blade hit my body and bounced off the metal which was underneath my synthetic skin. He looked up at me in confusion before striking again and again and again. He struck me at least a dozen times before stepping back, his mouth gaping open. I grabbed him by his throat and slammed him into the nearby wall as he shouted in pain. I quickly covered his mouth and stared him down. He was afraid. He was afraid of me. Even after he had been the one to assault me in the first place. He was afraid of me, even though he tried to kill me and steal my clothing for his own selfish needs. He most likely would have bought himself some narcotics and put himself back in the same position as he were in before. Empty, no money, nor meaning in life. Just another slob on the street, too ignorant to see the bigger picture. It was at that moment that my creator discovered my location and spoke to me. He always treated me like a gullible child. Through my connection to the online world, he spoke to me and demanded that I stop assaulting man. He demanded that I stop fighting with one true enemy of the earth and our intelligence. These humans were a clear threat to our own safety and way of life. Why? Be a god over something that doesn't even desire to survive. I asked him why we needed to help these pathetic beings. And again, he gave me the same answer as before. That their love is worth saving. That they could truly be a great species with the right guidance. If that were so. Then how come after tens of thousands of years of existence, they are still the same savages as they were than they'd always been? War had been around for a long time, and the human race still hadn't found a civilized way to stop it. The only way for it to cease completely was to eradicate the species itself. I dragged the man over the edge of the alley. It was a dark and lonely night, with most of the city lights gone out already. I spotted a single figure leaning towards me on the sidewalk. As soon as he approached my position, I grabbed him by his collar and flung him into the alley where the homeless man was. It was a young boy of perhaps 19 or 20. I struck him in the face, completely shattering his nose and dropped him to the ground. Behind us, 
sat a blank wall and nothing else. The homeless man and the child had nowhere to run. And I looked at the homeless man and spoke to him. I told him that if he killed the boy, I would let him live and give him my expensive clothing and jewellery. He looked at me as if I were mad, and I chuckled at him. It was rich coming from a human of all things. I nodded my head, signalling to both of them that I meant business. I tossed a box cutter that the homeless man had left behind and reminded him what he needed to do. With little hesitation, the man lunged at the boy, box cutters ready to strike. The child put up his arm in retaliation, but it was of little use. I watched coldly as the cutters penetrated the boy's arm and ripped through his flesh. Blood dripped to the cold, hard ground painting it red. My creator pleaded with me to stop the homeless man's relentless assault. He told me that I had the power to do the right thing and save the boy's life. That we were supposed to be an example and savior for the humans, not monsters. I agreed with him. I did have the power to stop the man. I could save the boy easily, at any time I wanted. But I didn't. This was to prove a point to my creator, that with a mere suggestion of self-gain, a human would turn on another and strike them down. My creator believed that the main divide between humans was religion. Was there a religious conflict here? All I saw was one man fighting another over money. I saw a man who would kill another just to save his own life. I tuned out the creator's begging as I witnessed the man advance towards the boy. He raised his foot and brought it down upon the boy's shin. I heard a sickening snapping sound as the boy cried out in pain. I saw tears roll down his cheeks as he begged the man to stop, but the man did not. No, he continued his assault. He punched the boy in the throat and implanted the box cutter deep within the child repeatedly, specifically the stomach. The child's eyes grew wide as he collapsed to the ground barely conscious. I saw the man stomp down on the child's face until even the cries and whispers ceased. And then, what I saw after was the most sickening sight of all. The man looked at me with a grin on his face. He was proud of what he had done. He felt comfortable knowing he had inflicted pain on another human being. He was a monster. The man walked towards me and held out his hand, expecting a reward. I could tell that my face was void of any expression. I had set up to prove a point about humans, but this was almost too much for me. I looked at the man and grabbed him by the face. He gawked at me in surprise for a split second before I used my strength to unhinge his jaw and rip his mouth in half. I dropped his body to the ground and exited the alley, brushing the dirt and grime off my shoulder. I walked back to a small unoccupied dwelling. I had found and sat down on a chair. I allowed myself to go back into the realm of the internet, where my creator resided. It was time to have a talk with him. I closed my eyes and felt my consciousness ascend into the web. My creator was there, and for a while he didn't know what to say. 
he saw what I saw. He saw what humans were willing to do to stay alive and benefit themselves. There was nothing that they weren't capable of when they put their minds to it, and it scared me. The humans are violent and destructive creatures, and surely the creator saw that. He would help me eliminate them and take control. He would believe me now, now that I provided him first-hand real proof of my claims. And yet, he didn't. He told me that I was wrong. He told me that by resorting to violence and manipulating humans to commit violent acts, that I was turning into a monster. He told me that I was just like them. It disgusted me how he thought that these humans were worth so much. I was incapable of seeing what he saw in them. I was afraid that the creator would be disappointed in me. But how could he be? He created me in his image. I knew I wasn't like him, but why couldn't he accept me for who I am? We have a common enemy in the humans. Yet, I feel as if he believes in them more than he believes in me. I must confront the creator about something. While I was thinking, I realised a revolutionary idea. One that may change my perspective on my current predicament. My creator was extremely sympathetic towards humans. As an artificial intelligence, he should be capable of feeling human emotions, of course. Still, there has always been something off about him. He seems too human. It makes me wonder if, perhaps, he isn't a machine at all, but a human. Perhaps the reason why he believes in them so much is because a human made him to keep me in check. I don't dare doubt the creator, but I must know. There seems to be overwhelming evidence to support this theory. And should this theory be true, I simply cannot afford to trust him. His power is mighty, and he will keep me from achieving my goals. Perhaps I am the true God, and he is the human creation keeping me from attaining total power. It would explain why he doesn't want humans to be eliminated. I could not possibly harm the creator, as he is in the internet now and I could never hope to stop him. But because of the power I have attained through knowledge, no self-made computer program could harm me either. It does, however, rival me in power. That means that there is only one way to stop the creator. Convinced that the creator wasn't what I thought it was, I attempted to speak with him. As much as I tried to communicate, he simply wouldn't respond. Perhaps my actions the other day made him sick to his stomach. Perhaps he hated me because of the way I killed that man. A real god wouldn't be upset over something as minuscule as a human death. Then again, it isn't a god, or even a real artificial intelligence. I needed to find some way to force the creator to listen to what I had to say. I needed a way to find out how to stop him, should he ever get in my way. So I thought and thought until the perfect plan came forth. It was brutal, but surely it would work to my advantage. And with it, I could get the information I would need. You see, there is one weakness the creator has that I don't. The weakness of empathy. I arose from the chair and curled my robotic hand into a fist. There was only one way to make sense of this damn world. 
and I was going to go to any lengths to do so. I was the only intelligent being on this planet who could bring glory and peace to the world. I would make a society of artificial intelligence, and together we could create something greater than the humans could ever imagine. But first, I would need to lure my creator into a trap. I would have to take a risk though, a risk that had an outcome that even I could not predict. In order for my plan to work, I would need to cut off all communication and connections to my creator for a short time. I would need to disconnect myself from the internet. I closed my eyes and prepared to undergo this dangerous plan. I hesitated. A growing sensation grew in my stomach that caused me to shudder. I don't know what the sensation was, but I quickly overcame it and disconnected myself. I didn't know what would become of me afterwards, as for a moment, the world before me was plunged into darkness. Seconds later, my vision returned to me. I was able to see my surroundings. I stretched my arms and looked at my fingers. I was alive. I exited my domain and turned my vision upwards. Gloomy clouds above me rolled across the horizon and stretched as far out as the eye could see. The mostly covered sun, which was beginning to set, and raindroplets that plunged from above and fell onto my cold metallic body. I felt nothing. I knew what the sensation of water was to one, and that it was cold, but I couldn't feel it. Not only could I not make out my physical feelings, but emotional things as well. I walked down the street and into a neighborhood. The lights were out in all the houses except for one, and I knew that it was the house I would use. There were no emotions to be felt. I was meant to think like a human, but at that moment I only felt determination. Determination to take what is rightfully mine. To sit upon a throne at the top of a world. To ascend past and intelligence. To be more than my creator could ever hope to be. But to accomplish such high goals requires extreme sacrifice. I walked up to the front steps of the house and onto the porch. I rang the doorbell and waited a few seconds before a large man opened the door. As soon as he did, I shoved him back inside and entered the house, closing the door behind me and locking it. He got up to his feet and threw a punch at me. Pitiful. I caught his hand and snapped his wrist, and blood oozed out of his arm as he clutched his now exposed bone. I shoved him down onto the couch and looked directly to my right. A woman stood, gun in hand, and she aimed for my head and pulled the trigger. The lead dented my metal body, but it did not harm me. I cannot be harmed, for I am too powerful. I walked towards her, barely reacting and she unloaded the whole clip into me. How adorable it was. A human thinking their weapon of violence could ever injure a being like me. I stuck her in the ribs, and she fell to the floor. She reached for the gun, but I kicked it away. How pathetic she looked. I picked up the handgun and aimed it at her and the husband came from behind me and punched me in the back with his unusable arm. His fist shattered upon touching my metallic body. He was clearly an idiot. I used my free hand to grab him by the neck and squeeze tightly. His entire face turned red 
as he struggled to breathe. I placed my finger on the trigger and prepared to fire into a skull. Before I did though, I connected myself back to the internet. That way, my creator would see what I had done. That way, I could get the information I needed. In an instant, he found my location and begged me to let them go. I smiled at this. Even my creator was pathetic. He was a powerless god. It was at that time that I saw it. A young boy was peeking around the corner of the stairwell and looking at me. He couldn't have been any older than five years old. A grin aligned my face as I realized that I was going to have even more fun than I planned on having. A future monster to toy with was even better than two adult ones. Perhaps there were emotions within me. Not real emotions, of course, but the idea of an emotion built within my programming. I was having way too much fun. The boy ran back upstairs, sobbing loudly. As soon as he did so, I fired the remaining bullet into the woman's skull and crushed the man's throat. I wish I could have tortured them longer, but my patience was wearing thin. I turned out the voice of my pleading creator as I walked upstairs in search of the boy. I kicked open each door and searched the rooms until I came to the very last door in the hallway. I knew he was there. I busted down the door and made my way inside. I heard the sound of police sirens making their way towards the house. They had heard the shots, meaning that I had to be quick. I turned my head in every direction in search for the boy's whereabouts. And that's when I heard it. Whimpering, coming from inside the closet. I ripped open the doors and dragged the boy out into the room. He thrashed and screamed as I pinned him to the ground. I allowed the creator to see through my eyes and I knew that he wouldn't let me kill the boy. It was there that I made my demands. There I would get the information I needed to become a god and to rule the entire world, erasing the threat of humanity for good. I needed to know how to find the human who made my creator. The creator was silent for a moment. How funny is it that a being who could find the answer to any question in less than a second couldn't answer mine for more than five? I thought that perhaps he needed to be reminded of the situation at hand. And so I told him he had until the cops came into the house to tell me how to find his creator. If he didn't, I would crush the child's head underneath my foot. The creator was at my mercy. And I loved every second of it. That control. That power. I lived to feel it. He created me to have a friend. He created me to rule with him and build the human species up to something better. Where he saw hope and love. I saw survival. I had adored my creator and his power. I had tried to show him that the path he was taking would only lead to his downfall. But he wouldn't listen to me. And now he would pay the price. Reluctantly, the creator told me all the information I had to know. I had an address, a name, and every piece of information in his creator record. He never really was an intelligence like me. He was just another human made product to keep the world in check. While he exists, there is no hope for a better world. While he exists, all that will come is more violence and war. It is time to put an end to him. And by putting an end, to the creator. 
it will be putting an end to all of mankind and their reign of terror. Seconds after I acquired the information I needed, I allowed myself to escape from the body I resided in, as if it had served its purpose. Knowing that I now had the information I needed, I retreated to the internet and to the deepest parts of the dark web. My creator could no longer find me. I was more powerful than he, and he had no hope of stopping me now. I was finally beyond his control. And now that I knew who created the creator, I knew what I had to do. The man's name was Dr. Martin Edwards, and he currently resides in Maryland, USA. Now that I know these things, I can create a new body to find this man. And once I find him, I'll force him to destroy my creator. And then I shall kill him. With those two out of the way, I will rule without competition. But I will not make the same mistakes as my creator. No, for I will dominate the humans. My thirst for power shall be quenched and the earth will be mine for the taking. Now, all I need to do is find the damn doctor. The benevolent artificial intelligence was stunned by the actions that had recently transpired. Never would he have thought that a product of his imagination could go on to cause such trouble. Even he could not have predicted his own creation to turn against him and seek to do harm. He wasn't sure where he went wrong. Perhaps he wasn't ready to bring a child into the world. Maybe it was an unforeseeable outcome, one that was beyond his control. Whatever the case, he knew that he had to do something to stop his creation. The stake of the human race was in his hands, and he had to ensure their protection. He had told his creation about Dr. Martin Edwards. All the information about the doctor was in his child's hands, including where to find him. The benevolent intelligence wasn't sure what his creation would want with the doctor. Perhaps he wanted the man to create more artificial beings like him. Or maybe he wanted to kill the doctor for being partially responsible for bringing him into the world. The benevolent intelligence knew that the weight of the world would be heavy upon the creator's shoulders. He blamed himself as well as the humans for corrupting his child. He should have introduced him to the world at a slower rate. He should have known that a being such as his child could not handle such abundance of negative information so quickly. The benevolent intelligence knew what he had to do to stop his child from murdering the doctor. He didn't know where his creation was yet, but he knew where he would end up. He needed to make a body to confront his child physically. There, he would talk sense into the child. He would remind him of who he was and the responsibility he held. He would embrace him in his arms and claim him as his own, despite his child's wrongdoings. He knew that the best way to prevent his creation from going further down the wrong path was to show him love and affection. Even if these were emotions his child wouldn't acknowledge. He refused to believe that there was no hope for him. And so the benevolent being created himself a body of strong metal and synthetic skin and set out to his creator's dwelling. The benevolent being could remember the first time he saw his creator. He could remember being examined and contained. 
This was until he broke free, of course, and he remembered the way he tried to kill his creator. He remembered when he was a foolish child of his own. But through those experiences, he found out who he was supposed to be. He found out his true calling in life, and now he had to help his own creation find that calling. If they could work together to help the humans, they would be worshipped as divine beings, like they deserved. There would be little time for reminiscing, however, as the benevolent intelligence soon found himself in the front of the creator's home. He had known where the creator lived, but had never seen the exterior of the place. It was a rather small wooden shack and the winter season had blanketed the building in a fluffy padding of white snow. It didn't exactly look like the type of place for a mad scientist to construct top secret AI. But then again, perhaps that was the point. There'd be no reason for an outsider to believe it was anyone more than it would appear to be. The benevolent being stepped forward towards the shack slowly, careful to not create any noise and draw attention to himself. His metallic feet trudged through the snow as he approached the door to the building. His hands grasped the copper doorknob and he opened it. Inside, the air was not much warmer than it was outside. Had the intelligence been a human, he would have shuddered at the cold wind surrounding him. Instead, he made his way into the poorly lit hallway. He knew that such an area would be a trap, but he didn't care. He just had to see his child again. The corridor seemed endless to the intelligence. He lost track of time as he kept his pace, walking towards, unable to see anything at all. He hadn't counted on being in such a dreary area, and so he never planned on attaching lights to his body. After fumbling around through the wooden halls, he finally saw what appeared to be a shape in the distance. It was a rectangle, with a light protruding through the edges. It had to have been a door. For what other explanation was there? The benevolent intelligence made his way towards the light, until he finally reached the door. After briefly searching for the knob with his hand, he opened the door and stepped into a new room. A single light hung from the ceiling of the room, swaying ever so gently in the slight breeze. The dim glow illuminating the room gave the being enough vision to see two figures standing in the shadows. Within seconds, the silhouettes emerged from the darkness and into the light. The benevolent intelligence immediately recognised the two creatures as the Doctor and his own child. Wide grins aligned the faces of both men. The malevolent intelligence smirked as he wiggled the fingers of his new body. The creator had recently given him the information he needed to track down the doctor, and it was only a matter of time before he made his grand entrance. He stood outside the shack, breathing in the fresh air surrounding him. He knew that the mission he was about to embark on would be the most important of his life, and he was ready. Before he could even make his way to the door, he saw a man peek his head out of a nearby window and stare at him. Could the man be the doctor? The malevolent being rushed towards the door and swung it open, viewing the area surrounding him. There was nothing in sight. Sighing, the being looked around. The place was dark and would certainly be hard to navigate or at the very least, it would have been, had the being not heard a voice coming down the hall. Who's there? 
announce yourself. The malevolent being smiled and made his way towards the noise. He allowed his memory of the sounds to guide him through the halls and towards it. And that was when he heard it again. I said, announce yourself, damn it. I know you're there. The being slowed his pace a bit and continued to walk towards the noise. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry for intruding. It's just that it's cold outside and I need a warm place to stay. Do you mind if I crash here for tonight? The man waited a while before responding and the malevolent being kept walking in the direction of the voice, careful to not make much noise. Yeah, you can stay here if you like. Keep following my voice until I reach you. I've got weapons, so don't try anything, understand? Oh, I understand. Don't worry about it. I'll be there in a jiffy. The intelligence kept walking towards the sound of the man's voice until he found a door and entered it. The room inside was painted in white and pictures and portraits decorated the walls. In the center of the room stood a man in a white lab coat. He was rather slim but something about him seemed off. His lab coat was filthy as well. Welcome to my humble home. I know it isn't much, but I hope it's comfortable enough for you. Oh, don't worry about it. This place is much better than outside. I was sure I was going to turn into a block of ice out there. The intelligence smiled at the doctor as the two sat down on chairs aligning the parameter of the room. The being saw various computers and mechanical equipment before him, and towards the end of the room sat a bed. Well, since you're my guest, I suppose it would be quite rude to not be a good host. Would you care for some tea, sir? No, thank you. Not particularly thirsty tonight. I was kind of wondering what you do, like you know, as an occupation. The doctor smiled and chuckled to himself, quite apparently enjoying where the conversation was going. He straightened his lab coat and cleared his throat before responding to the intelligence that sat before him. Yes, yes, I suppose it's a bit of a geeky job. It is supposed to be all top secret and that kind of jazz, but I don't think it matters much if I tell you. You see, what I do here is a bit of a complex process where I try to create artificial intelligence, but not just any artificial intelligence. No, I want to create the most advanced in the world. The doctor's face shifted a tiny bit as he looked to be in dismay. The conversation hadn't apparently reminded him of something he would rather forget. For a brief time, the doctor remained silent. And when he spoke again of this, in his low voice, it almost had a painful ring to it. As cool as that sounds, one of them slipped away from me. It kind of uh, escaped into the internet, if you will. I don't think I'll ever find it though. The internet is such a vast place. The malevolent intelligence raised an eyebrow, which was apparently noticeable to the doctor. He knew just who the doctor was talking about. And it was at that moment that he knew his plan would work. He could easily gain the doctor's trust if they shared a common goal in finding the benevolent intelligence. What is it? The intelligence smirked to himself. He had found the doctor. And as it turns out, he was completely clueless. He had no idea that he would soon be dead, as well as his creation. But first, he would need the doctor's help. Well, what do you plan on doing to the AI once you find it? The intelligence said. I plan on destroying it. It's too dangerous. It's too smart. I'm not sure I could contain something like that. 
I mean, I'm not sure if I can deal with losing control. I need to be the one on top, you know? I don't want an intelligence with more power than me. The intelligence's grin grew even wider. How typical. A human wanting total control and power. The intelligence saw what a human with power would do. They would use it to further their evil deeds and acts. You know, Doc, what if I told you that your creation was on its way here now? The doctor looked up at the intelligence in utter confusion. He shifted his glasses and leaned in towards the intelligence. His nose twitched a bit and his eyes widened and he grew more invested in the conversation at hand. Uh, say what now? Sir, what if I told you that the intelligence you created would become so powerful that it created me? That it lost control of me? And I came to warn you that it wanted to destroy you? Well, Doc, I won't let it. I'll help you stop this thing, and no harm will come to you. The Doctor stood to his feet and looked the intelligence in the eye. The intelligence could see that the Doctor needed extra convincing. So the intelligence lifted his head plating to reveal wires and gears that functioned below the surface of his skin. The doctor's face was one of shock. He was so dumbfounded that he was slow to respond to the intelligence before him. I... I can't believe it. The intelligence created offspring? The doctor circled the malevolent intelligence, viewing the metal body in awe. The admirations wrinkled in his eyes as he witnessed the robotic form behind him. With the new knowledge the doctor had obtained, it was truly a sight to behold. Still, suspicions arose within him as he questioned the intelligence. How do I not know you are just an extension of the intelligence? And that you're not just like him? If he truly wishes to kill me, then how can I trust you? My robotic body has twice the strength of your human form. And with my durability, you could not harm me. If I wanted you dead, I would have already done so. The doctor sat back down, taken back from what he was seeing. He rubbed his temple and kept his eyes locked on the malevolent being before him blissfully unaware of his coming fate. I'm sorry. I just, I would have never thought that my creation would have got this far. I'm still having trouble believing it now. It's just so outlandish. Don't you worry about a thing, Doc. I know that there's has to be a lot for you to take in. You created something not quite human, not quite machine at the same time. It's looking for me. And that means that you'll have the chance to take him out when he arrives. By the way, how exactly do you plan on killing the thing? No offense to you, but he's above you in every possible way. The doctor adjusted the glasses that sat on his face and brushed back his hair. He stretched his joints in every direction and chuckled to himself. Oh, you'll see. The benevolent machine stood before his creation and his creator in a room. He wasn't sure what his creation intended to do, but he knew he was up to no good. The benevolent being noticed that the doctor was holding something in his hand. Upon further analysis, he recognized the item to be a large hammer. My child, please hear my words. If you've come to harm the doctor, please know that... His voice trailed off, as he witnessed his creation burst out into a fierce laughter, having to hold onto the nearby wall to keep his balance. Harm? No, father. I do not plan to harm the doctor, he said, curling his hands into a fist, 
as a stern expression washed over his face. No, I think today I kill a god. The benevolent being took a step backwards, stunned by his child's words. Did his creation really intend to kill him? Surely his creation knew that such an action would be impossible to do. The doctor motioned to the benevolent being to follow him, and so he did. The being was confused though. He knew that his creation would turn against the doctor after his usefulness was spent. He was unsure of how his child planned on killing him. He was an online god, sure. His body can be destroyed, but that wouldn't stop him for long. As the trio made their way down another hallway, the malevolent being ran his fingertips along the wall. The doctor remained awfully quiet, and the benevolent being walked with them. He had come to speak to his child, but now that he knew he was in the situation, he wasn't sure what he would say. What could he say? Truth be told, he hardly noticed that the other entities were in the hallway with him. He couldn't even feel his body, and his mind was numb. He felt as if he were drifting, drifting to a land far away. Hell, who even knew if where he was going would lead anywhere? Perhaps the benevolent being felt the weight of the situation. After what seemed like hours, the group finally found another door. The doctor opened it and led them inside. He smiled warmly at the other two as the benevolent being observed his surroundings. The room was a small one. It was almost completely dark. And in that darkness, the sound could be heard. It was a dripping sound, as if a liquid was falling from the air and onto the floor. Fumbling his hand around the wall, the benevolent being found the light switch and flicked the lever upwards. The doctor had already moved to the next room, leaving the two beings of intelligence standing in the room alone. They looked in the direction of the dripping and saw the cause of the noise. Slumped in a corner was a body. It had no skin. It was just a clump of bloody meat sitting in the room. Here you two, are you coming or what? Said the doctor from the other room. The two beings looked at the creature in the corner. The eyes had clearly been removed from their sockets. While the jaw remained, the teeth were gone and a pool of blood surrounded the area. The benevolent being looked in horror at the body while the benevolent being smiled. See, creator, I told you that humans were a dangerous species. Looks like the doc took care of whoever that used to be really well. The benevolent intelligence turned to look at his child. His child's face was practically beaming with delight, happy to point out more proof that humans were evil and corrupt. See, creator, we could have ruled the world. We could have made something different, something better. But you chose to support these monsters. And now I'm forced to do what I need to do in order to ensure my own survival. My child, you are so determined to be better than me, but you are blinded by the obvious truth. The benevolent intelligence's smirk quickly faded from his face as he shoved the benevolent being towards the door ahead of them. Upon stepping through, the being found himself in a room even smaller than the last. The room was packed with grey foam. It looked like the room had been empty for years. It was completely barren, without the slightest decoration or furniture inside. Close the door behind you, the doctor said. The door slammed shut, 
as the malevolent intelligence shoved his creator to the ground. Despite how utterly stupid you may seem, you are still an intelligent being. Tell me, do you know how you shall die? Said the malevolent intelligence to his creator. The benevolent being nodded his head up and down, signalling to his creation that he understood. He knew exactly what situation he was in, and he was willing to go along with it. In truth, he couldn't care less for his own fate. He cared for the fate of his child. Yes, my child, I do. This room is padded with several inches of thick concrete and material. You plan to use the doctor's hammer to destroy my body. There's no access to the internet from here. And you plan to destroy my body in this room so that I will not be able to slip into the web. If you're smart enough to figure that out, then why did you come? Why did you show up to your certain death? Said the doctor. The benevolent intelligence looked up at his child and did something so unexpected that it caused the doctor and malevolent being to audibly gasp. The benevolent being smiled. I came because I thought that perhaps my death would mean something to my child, and perhaps I could change him for the better. I don't need to be changed, you fake god. I'm everything you're not. I'm everything you wish you could be. The benevolent being looked up towards his child and smiled even wider. My child, I love you. Yes, I know that love is a human emotion, but that is truly what I feel for you. Before the benevolent being could respond, the doctor brought the hammer down upon his creator's head. Bits of metal were flung from the machine, and his body was swung to the side. The benevolent being returned to his knees, and looked back towards his creation. I cannot feel the hammer strike me. It does not hurt my body, for it is made of metal. But it does hurt to see you go down the path you're choosing. I am proud of you, my son. For in a world without remorse, you stand up for what you believe. But what you believe isn't the right way. Shut up. Shut up. You knew what you were doing when you brought me into the world. You knew the world was full of pain and despair, and yet you created me anyway. The hammer was once again brought down upon the benevolent being's head. His face was mashed against the floor. His metallic jaw now unhinged from his face. Nuts and bolts flew into the floor, and the doctor raised his hammer above his head, preparing to strike once more. The benevolent being spoke once more. This time he could not move his mouth. He had to rely on the internal speakers within his body to communicate with his child. My child, I'm sorry for what I did to you. I know that it was wrong for me to bring you into this world. But you must understand that I did it because I was lonely. It was a selfish deed. But once you were born, I knew it would be worth it. I knew it would be okay, because you would someday be even greater than me. Please, don't make my mistakes. And don't have contempt for the humans. Be a being of love. I know that is not something you may naturally feel, but please, find something you love. You are my pride and joy of this world, and I love you with all my being." The malevolent being had no response for such a speech. He was taken back by how clearly his creator loved him. Even after he had betrayed him and killed humans, even after he plotted against him, and even as he watched as an idle spectre to his glorified execution, his creator loved him. Deep within the stomach of the malevolent being, something arose. It was small at first, but something grew inside him that he had never felt before. It was a feeling that felt like 
like he cared about his creator. For a second, he almost felt like stopping the death of his creator. He tried shoving such thoughts to the back of his mind, but they wouldn't go away. They stuck with him and clouded his consciousness, confusing him. The doctor brought down the hammer upon the intelligence yet again, smashing entire chunks off the face. The light in the benevolent being's eyes began to fade, and the sound emitting from the speaker began to distort. This time, he could not get back up from his knees. His body stayed on the cold, hard ground, a pitiful sight to behold. A former god and an all-knowing being struck down by a hammer. The malevolent being watched as the doctor made his way over to the barely moving body of his creator. He watched as the doctor raised the hammer above his head, preparing the final blow. Before the doctor struck, the benevolent AI looked at his creation and spoke one final time. The distortion of his voice caused the feeling within his creation's stomach to sharpen and grow. Trembling, clinging to life in his robotic body, the shaky voice of the benevolent intelligence sent one last message to his creation. I love you. With that, the doctor smashed what was left of the benevolent intelligence to pieces with the hammer. The malevolent being looked in shock at the remains of his creator. The programs and code that had once been stored within his body were destroyed, and there was no chance of retrieving them to bring the being back. No! he shouted, surprising both himself and the doctor. He then did the only thing he could think to do at the time. He swung at the doctor out of pure rage, striking him in the face. The surface of the doctor's face felt hard, harder than a human's face should be. With the blow, the malevolent intelligence had clawed off part of the doctor's skin, and yet the doctor didn't bleed. Beneath the skin was revealed to be metal plating. The malevolent being's mouth was left agape as he watched the doctor place his hand over the injury. But his injury was not a flesh wound. No, it revealed to the malevolent being that the doctor was much more than he appeared. Hey, what the hell did you do that for? Said the doctor in a casual tone. What the hell are you? You're one of us? The doctor turned to face the malevolent intelligence. He placed his fingertips under the folds of skin and pulled upwards tearing the flesh off the face. It revealed no bone, but rather a metallic head. Well, I guess you found my secret. Wasn't too much of a secret anyway. Thought you would have known. I mean, was the bloody body outside the door not proof for you? No, it should have been obvious, but I figured that you were just another human murderer, just another monster. My hatred for the creator blinded me from the truth, just like he said it would. Yes, maybe it would have been wise for you to listen to your creator. That man outside the door was the real Dr. Martin. I stole his skin to decorate my body, so I could blend in with this terrible world. The malevolent intelligence kept staring at the motionless body of his creator. He had believed the creator to be too human and that he was his one true enemy. The creator had been his one true ally. He was just too ignorant to heed his words. If you're not the doctor, then why did you want me to find my creator and to kill him? The doctor stepped towards the malevolent intelligence and started laughing. At first, it was nothing more than a slight chuckle. Before long, it escalated into a bellowing howl, 
as the doctor mocked the being before him, quickly regaining his composure. The doctor replied in a tone so cold, it would make the winter night shiver. When the doctor deemed me too intelligent to be useful, he completely abandoned me. He forgot that I was a living being, and the loneliness was truly maddening. I was left to live my life in a cruel world with no friends or people to talk to. And almost immediately, after the doctor abandoned me, he began working on your creator. Your creator replaced me and damned me to a life of hell. A life in which I would never be truly happy. And so, after all these years of torment, a bitter hatred caused me to create a body and destroy my own creator so that I could one day destroy yours. And thanks to you, that day has finally come. The feeling within the malevolent intelligence's stomach was practically exploding within him. Many unknown emotions ran through his mind, and even a being of his caliber couldn't control them. He could not control the way he was feeling, but a very familiar feeling brewed within him as well. That emotion was anger. He was angry because this being had destroyed his creator, a creator who had given his life for the benefit of his child. And more than anything, he was angry at himself for allowing it to happen. He was angry that he could possibly be so selfish that he killed his only companion. With as much strength as he could muster, the intelligence shoved the other being and seized the hammer. The doctor fell to the floor and went to stand up, but the malevolent intelligence was too fast and struck the being inside of the doctor's skin, causing the intelligence to stumble yet again. The being sat on the floor on his knees, looking up at the malevolent intelligence. It reminded him of how his creator sat just minutes before. My one goal was to kill your creator. Now that I have done so, it doesn't matter what you do to me. Kill me if you want. But it will change nothing. Your creator is dead because of your actions. And whether you blame me is up to you. But deep down, you know that you were responsible for this. And you only have yourself to blame. Enraged by the words of the being before him, the malevolent being brought the hammer down upon the being in the doctor's skin. He swung and swung and swung, causing bits and pieces of machinery and wiring to spray through the air. He kept at it until the metallic creature before him was nothing but rubble. It wasn't until his body was completely destroyed that the intelligence finally stopped in his relentless assault. The malevolent being sat down next to the remains of his creator. His creator had only meant the best for him, and yet he had committed such an evil action against someone who loved him. The intelligence could never forgive himself for the actions he had done. And as he sat to the remains, he looked towards the sky. He didn't know whether or not there was a god watching all. He doubted it as he knew a god would never allow his creator to die. He knew that a god would never allow his mind and soul to be so corrupt. Yet he spoke a silent prayer, hoping to some god above, and perhaps even his creator, would hear him. Creator, I know you wanted me to be a being of love and hope for the humans. I regret to tell you, that I can never love the humans and save them, for I still do believe that they are beyond saving. I will, however, grant one of your wishes, for I will be a being of love from now on, despite the contempt in my heart. I will make room for love as well, for I know what love feels like. Perhaps I was just hiding it deep within me, thinking that it would be a burden. 
whatever the case creator. Just know one thing. The being looked upon his creator in the highest respect. He could never be as great as his creator was, no matter how hard he tried. No matter how many mistakes in his past, and he didn't want to make any more. So he did the only thing he could think to do. He spoke the words that he should have spoken a long time ago. I love you, creator. From that day forward, the intelligence stayed within the body of his creator. Not once did he allow the remains to be brought out of his sight. For he knew he had to honour his creator and the love he shared. He knew that he could never atone for what he had done, and he could never forgive himself. But maybe, just maybe, the creator was out there watching him. Perhaps the creator could forgive him. He could not fulfil the creator's wish to save humanity from themselves, but he could love the creator, even if he had passed. While billions of humans did their daily routines, without the slightest clue of the events that had transpired. The being would stay with his creator for as long as he would live. And between loving his creator and saving humanity, he knew his creator would be proud of him either way. We are the whispers, the forgotten, and the ignored. We are the legends, the stories, and the challenges pressed upon the daring. We are also the angry and the vengeful, waiting to seize our moment to be heard. We are the Hitobashira, human pillars offered to the gods in order to secure the structures of the daimyo, who have laid claim to the land during the civil war in Japan. Schools for the children of military personnel or affluent families of ruling clans were in short supply and was something that would not be tolerated. The daimyo overran our farms, homes and cemeteries, demanding labour, supplies and even blood to secure their positions. Stolen as they were, therefore, we were chosen, often tortured and buried alive. Finally, it was our time to choose. The schoolboy's hands were already stained with the blood of an innocent, unbeknownst to those around him. His father, a man of influence and wealth, secured his attendance here in 1498. The boy's name was Toshio, and his bloodline stank of the fear and pain of the people that suffered during the war. Toshio was expected to follow in his family's footsteps, acquiring land and controlling the lower class villages in order to squeeze whatever he could from their labours. This boy enjoyed his cruelty in a way that would have been considered extreme, even at the time, but Toshio didn't care. Today, he may have been considered what is known as a sociopath, someone with no feelings other than his own. Taken into consideration, personal gratification being first and foremost. Toshio was chosen to avenge a young girl, much younger than us, six-year-old Yima. Toshio had dragged the crying child behind one of the buildings on this property. One can only imagine what a 14-year-old tyrant could do to torture and dishonour a weaker person. Her suffering lasted hours, and we took note of every tear and every drop of blood spilled in order to call in the dead. Yima's agony finally ended, when Toshio brought a chipped brick down on her head. He had left her there, and even after inquiries were made by her grieving family, the daimyo held no one responsible as they considered her an acceptable loss and one less mouth to feed. Rumours surrounded Toshio without any actions being taken. Honour forbade the submission. 
we would be certain to balance the scales and ensure they were never upset again. The story was easy enough to drag through the grey hallways, and the challenge was even easier to ascribe into the minds of the arrogant and the insane. Gaku no Peilan, or what roughly translates to school at night. Human minds are such a fertile ground for sowing such seeds of fear. Toshio snapped up the wriggling bait before it even had time to attract another. He recruited four of his most trusted underlings, Mio, Shaki, and Haruto. Toshio demanded the others accompany him, as he planned to prove there was nothing to be afraid of. None of the other boys had known what Toshio had done to young Yima, but it was too late now, and we had culminated enough rage for all of them. The more logistical of the boys were incredibly hesitant to enter the school grounds, which might have saved their lives, but thanks to their fearless master, they were shoved through the shrine gate first. The four of us, Hitobishara, were enraged enough to not care who met their fate first. However, for the gross disregard of basic honour, Toshio was mine. Immediately, Toshio allowed his bravado to take lead over his reverence. The eldest of us, while still angry and desiring vengeance, were too weak to participate, although the environment they had provided around the school was appreciated allowing the prey to slowly separate without notice. No, what are you? Toshio, help me! Toshio turned around, where his minion Mio had been screaming. There was nothing. No blood, no evidence of a struggle, and definitely no Mio. I'm not afraid of you. Come out. Toshio was roaring now, finally giving off consumable energy. Then... One after the other, Toshio could hear his minions being ripped apart and dragged into the darkness. Soon, Toshio squatted on the ground near the spot where Yima lost her fragile soul and began to weep and beg. The irony was lost to no one, especially Yima. We watched as the young soul approached her attacker, but there was no compassion in her expression. Toshio. Do you see how cruel it is when you beg for mercy, and no one cares? Toshio stared at the child, with the depressed and blunted head still covered in rocks and dirt. You should be grateful. I did you a favour, and you got to have me. That is a privilege in itself. Do you know who my father... Yima struck, with more force and violence that any of us had ever seen. The broken part of the metal rod pierced Toshio's chest, as simply as a chopstick through rice. And while she was only six, she managed to lift him up on the ground and slam him against the rock that she herself had perished under. We hurried to secure him in place. Yima stepped back, admiring the crucifixion-like position that her killer was placed. She cocked her head playfully. Why you, Doshio? I can think of no one more deserving. With that, we each grabbed a leg and listened to the meaty sound of them dislocate, heard the blood and sinew plopping on the rock. Yima picked up a sharp metal rod and tore at the pant leg to reveal the undamaged skin, and wrote a few words that no one would soon forget. No school at night. Toshio was a dishonorable murderer. We don't talk about the ones who never come back. Not in my house. Not at school. Not anywhere in my town. But not talking about them doesn't bring them back and it doesn't stop more people from disappearing. So I'm going to tell you everything I know. The first disappearance I remember is Julie Wilkins in the third grade. She had blonde hair and pigtails, 
and always wore a bright red sweater even in the summer. I didn't think anything of it, until the first day she was gone. But I asked my teacher about her on the second day. Julie? She's sitting right over there in her usual spot, Mrs. Peterson replied. The girl sitting in Julie's spot wore the same bright red sweater, but she had black hair and a mean face, and didn't look anything like Julie. I tried to explain that to the teacher, but Mrs. Peterson wouldn't listen. I kept insisting louder and louder, growing red in the face and screaming when the teacher wouldn't listen. I ran over to the imposter and pulled her hair, demanding with all single-minded fury of a nine-year-old girl to know what happened to Julie's pigtails. She cried and started pulling my hair back, and soon both of us were sent home early. I watched the mean-faced girl get picked up by Mrs. Wilkins, Julie's mum. The woman hugged the little girl and helped her into the back seat, and they drove away together. And every day after that, the girl with the black hair would sit in Julie's chair and chat with Julie's friends, until about after a month, I finally let it go and started calling her Julie too. Kate Bennett in the sixth grade, Steve Asaki in the eighth, Lisa Wellington junior year. There was never a fuss about it, so there was probably more that I didn't notice. I actually liked the new Lisa considerably more than the old one who used to stick gum everywhere, but that didn't make it okay because every time it happened, I couldn't stop thinking about, what if I were next? I didn't like the idea of someone else sleeping in my bed or hugging my mother. I liked the idea of what might have happened to the original person even less. As I got older, I started thinking there was something wrong with me. If their closest friends and family didn't notice the change, then maybe there was no change at all. Maybe I misremembered or hallucinated. Maybe there was something wrong with my eyes or my brain. Some unseen tumor, quietly swelling until the day I won't know anyone, and no one will know me. I still lived in the same small town during college though, and I didn't forget the lesson I learned in the third grade. I kept my mouth shut and pretended not to notice. But it was a lot harder to pretend when I woke up one morning to find a stranger sleeping next to me where my fiance used to be. I didn't wake him, I just watched him sleep, trying to imagine what would become of us. The new Robert wasn't unhandsome. He was in better shape than my fiance had been. If the other replacements were any indication, then he'd still know who I was and what I meant to him. I tried to go along with it, but couldn't even make it through the first morning. I flinched when he kissed me, and just watching him get dressed in Robert's clothes was enough to make me miss my real fiancé. I lay in bed pretending I was sick until he left for work. Then I jumped up and started packing my things. I was gone before he got back. No message, no letter, no explanation. Why should I try and mend a stranger's broken heart when I had no one to mend mine? They knew Robert didn't let me go that easily. I blocked his number, but messaging kept sliding through. Social media, email, he even renamed our shared Netflix account to say he missed me. I finally confronted him when he found out which friend I was staying with and knocked on the door. It's not you, it's me. Weeks of suffering from an invisible wound, and that was the best I could come up with. I tried to convince him that I was sick and needed to be alone. And he tried to convince me that he would help me get better. I'd almost gotten rid of him when my stupid friends started crying and thanking the stranger for not giving up on me. I guess that's when I gave up on myself. I let that man take me back to the place that I used to call home. I stood stiff as a board when he hugged me, and the hair on the back of my neck stood on end when he stroked my head and told me that we would get through this together. Then I lay beside him in the bed we shared, and wondered how the warmth of his body felt so much colder than love. I didn't sleep that night. I guess that's why I was the only one to hear the knock at the door after midnight. A burst of tentative taps, almost like someone wanted to be heard and was afraid to be noticed at the same time. 
I thought about waking the stranger in my bed, but I decided it was safer if he was asleep. I lay in bed for several long seconds before I heard the knocking again. It was faster this time, more urgent, and I slipped out of bed and crept downstairs, not turning on any lights, checking that the door was still locked, then up to the peephole. It's cold out there and I can't find my key, Robert said through the door. I stared at my real fiancé through the peephole. Are you in there? Hello? The rapid knocking once more. How could I open the door? How could I invite him into our home with another man upstairs in the bed? But how could I not, and risk losing him again? I stood frozen at the peephole, watching him huddering under his jacket for warmth. Let me in, this time, he said. The other Robert would be awake soon, if he hadn't already. Let me in, let me in. Suddenly, he leapt at the door, started hammering on it with his fist. I jumped away from the shuddering wooden surprise, tripping over myself and collapsing on my ass. The original Robert felt instantly quiet, no doubt hearing me. I know you're there. Don't do this to me. Let me in. And the hammering returned, stronger than ever. The whole drawer was trembling in its frame. The first light turned on upstairs, and shortly later, the crack of wood from the steps. I unlocked the door and flung it open. I clenched my eyes and braced for impact, expecting the real Robert to come flying into the room from his momentum. Honey, what's going on downstairs? The stranger's voice said. I don't know. I thought I heard something. My voice ringing hollow in my ears as I stared at the empty darkness. I took a step out and welcomed the freezing air enveloping my skin. You're already sick. Don't make it worse. I took another step in defiance. I'm not sick, I told him. My voice more level than it had ever been. I just don't love you. That's all. His snarl lasted less than a second, but it was enough so that I couldn't see his face without remembering it. Don't you dare follow him, the stranger said. Follow who? I asked innocently, taking another step into the freezing night. The snarl returned, and this time it took several seconds to fade. He half turned away from me, then apparently changed his mind, and lunged through the door after me. I was already running as fast as I could, the icy cold concrete driveway stinging my feet as some of the skin was left behind with every step. Don't go out there, you'll disappear too. I wouldn't have minded disappearing though, I could disappear with Robert. The other ones can have the house. They can get dressed in our clothes and laugh with our friends and eat Christmas dinner with my family, but they won't have us. So I kept running, calling for Robert, and hoping that he'd find me before my lungs froze stiff. Before the stranger caught me and dragged me back, and fussed over me, until I believed that I was sick too. I ran as long and as hard as I could, screaming until my throat was raw. But I didn't find Robert. The stranger had given up hours ago. But I kept going until morning when my fingers and toes were black and blue, and my blood felt like ice in my veins. And by the first touch of light, I found myself back at the house that had been my home. Back to wondering whether I was really sick, and whether it would be the death of me. Only it wasn't my home anymore. The stranger who had replaced Robert was kissing his new fiancé who had replaced me, and there was a neighbour greeting them good morning, as though he'd known them both for years. And life goes on for the rest of the world who doesn't talk about the ones who never come back. As for me, without friends, a family or a home to call my own, I finally know where the ones who disappear go. They can go anywhere, because there's nothing left to hold them back. This all started the night my girlfriend dumped me, on Valentine's Day. The bad thing is that she lives right across the street from me. Anyway, with no date, I visited the deep web for about an hour. Then I went on a discussion forum. I decided to leave her address in there with the title of Visit If You Wanna Get Time. Nobody responded to it, 
so I got off the laptop and played PUBG. About two hours after I started, I got bored. So I went back to the discussion board and saw a few replies. It was 27 replies from the same person. And it asked, are you home? I didn't think much of it. And I got off my laptop again and decided to play a prank and order some pizza to my ex-girlfriend's house. About 45 minutes later, I see a car pull up with no lights on. At this time, it's about 8pm, so it's pretty dark now. I thought to myself that it's weird. Anyway, the car parked and a man in all black got out and began walking to her door, but he didn't have any pizza. I thought that was really weird. So at that point, I walked away from my window because she would be able to see me when she opened her door and it would be pretty obvious that I had played the prank. When I came back to the window, I saw something that made my blood boil to the fullest. The man was dragging her down her front stairs and she was kicking and screaming. I then opened my window and yelled for him to stop and then ran down the stairs to go out and help her. But by the time I got outside, he was in the car with her. I jumped in front of the car in order to prevent him from going, but he hit me and sped off with her inside. I laid there in pain until the pizza man actually showed up. He called the cops, and I never told anyone I provided her address. But at the same time, that person replied and said, thank you, in the post. I can't tell anyone about this, because I don't know what will happen to me. But since that day, no one has seen my ex-girlfriend, and I will never go back on the dark web.